We are actually live. Nice. Steve Brown, welcome to the H Hour Studio, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. We've been trying to line it up for um for a long time, haven't we? Uh yeah. I think we first had comms what? Two years ago? I was thinking two years, mate. Two yeah. years ago? Two years. Yeah, two years ago. And I'm glad we can make it work. Um so we've got me and you. We have got uh just so people are aware, we got this is actually live streaming now for the first time ever to uh, one of the HR Platinum patrons who will have the opportunity to jump in with questions. So you'll ping them into a chat. Mr. Coke, we shall call him. You'll ju- ping them into the chat. And if basically, if they're, if I can bring those up in the conversation, I will do it. Otherwise, I'll leave them to the end. But Coke is actively oh. listening. He will be judging you, Steve. Yeah, he know, will yeah. be pinging questions. He will be catching you out. He hates me. He hates me already. <laughs> I can tell. I can feel it. <laughs> Mate, been a pleasure. Well, not been a pleasure. It is a pleasure. All right, I'm okay. going. <laughs> yeah, done. So, at the end of the icebreaker, you were talking about. So, you were about to start on a second unexpected life threatening situation. Unexpected life threatening situation. And uh, I stopped you there and said, whoa, 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 Jose, let's do that at the start of the podcast. This is now the start of the podcast. Let's do that incident. What was the incident? Well, it's probably going to be a bit of an anticlimax now. <laughs> because... <laughs> this is the start of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. it, what happened, right? Just set a low bar. Set a yeah, low set bar. A low bar. Here we go. Ready, <laughs> set, go. Right, we're in, um, we're in Norway. That's something I've, I've written about in one of my books, this. I've written about everything. But we were, um, we were skiing off a mountain. I'll say a mountain. Yeah, I think it's justifiable. It was a massive hill. We'd been up doing a comms recce with the Sig Sant Major and a couple of others. We had loads of kit. And we were skiing off with a load, you know, a, a, a polk, like a sled full of radios that weighed a ton. Luckily, that wasn't strapped to me. It was strapped to one of the blokes who was a skiing instructor. And then, um, basically, we were skiing off because it was a whiteout up on the top. As we were skiing down, we heard just massive... Boom, right? And when you get your aid memoir, when you do your Arctic training, they tell you about signs of a warning signs of a um, avalanche. And one of them is what well, used to be anyway, booming. And it's like this boom, <laughs> the noise of booming. The like, boom. And I was like, what? And then a cracking noise. And I'm, honestly, mate, all the blokes in front of me just seem to drop like a couple of feet. And if, if, if as I dropped as well. I was just like, and I looked up to my left, and there was this big crack in the snow. It's, I think a lot of people would say that's bullshit. That would never happen. It would have gone. I don't. Know, but this is exactly how I remember. There was this big fucking gap in the snow, like running all the way across this side of this hill we're on. And I was like, oh, fuck, you know, we're definitely going to get just going to go any second. We're going to get caught in an avalanche. So we're going through our avalanche drills, like loosening the ski bindings. I mean, this is how I remember it, the drills anyway. Loosen ski bindings, take the bergen off one shoulder, and then you're supposed to like get your paracord ready. You've got um, avalanche cord, I think it's called. It's basically paracord, but it's got arrows on arrows on it. So if anyone, if you're buried in snow and someone's digging for you, when they find this cord, they follow the arrows back to the body. Ah. So I'm not sure that would really work because the cord could be fucking all over the place. But I thought, fuck me, man! I really thought we were gonna. I really thought we were gonna get caught in an avalanche. I was shitting myself. And we were all sort of looking around at each other like, what the fuck? And then the sergeant major was like, right, you need to get rid of that polka because one of the blokes, I think it was Al Watson, remember him? Yeah, yeah. I, I saw. Well, no, I didn't see Al in uh, Arnhem recently. No, but I, yeah, Al, I'm pretty sure, memorable he, individual. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was the MSI, and he was he was at the front of the polk, which was basically two bars and a strap. So that pulp would have gone. The pulp probably weighed a couple of hundred kilos. It's just full of tents and radio kit. Yeah, and um, it was like, right, you need to let that go. So the sergeant major, fair play to him. He just basically he got he got the pulp off Al, and turned, orientated it down the hill, and just fucking let it go. And it just went off like that, like a bobsled. And it just went bouncing down the hill, and it just went off into the distance. And I think we got that back, but um, yeah, thank fuck, because we weren't really very good skiers. Al could ski. So he was a skiing instructor. The rest of us pretty much walked around Norway on, on skis, you know, <laughs> and falling over all the time. And But that was a, that was a f- really scary. You know, we were just laughing, you know, what a bloke's like. We were just laughing about it. But, off, yeah, being thinking I was going to get caught in an avalanche, <coughs> that was really scary. Yeah, that was. That probably might be the scariest thing you know, I've ever come across. Ever happened, really? To be yeah. It's Interesting. Like, Why do you think that is? Because it, it, it's probably... It's probably you've probably had situations where you're actually been close to losing your life. But oh, you yeah. can probably do something about it. Yeah, right. That's it. That's it. That's fair. That's a lot fairer, really. 
you know, if you've got a weapon, they've got a weapon. It's like, and it comes down more down, or a lot of it comes, to, it's a bit of luck. A lot of it comes down to skills and drills, doesn't it? Like force on force. You know, obviously if you get caught in an ambush or an IED, that's different. But, you know, skills can get you out of that sort of shit. But if you're going to get stuck in an avalanche, what was in the aid memoir and what you used to get taught, I don't know if it's still taught like this, was that what you should do in the, in the last few moments, as you feel the avalanche slowing down, right, bearing in mind there's probably millions of tons of snow and ice fucking smashing you to bits, you have to do a double backstroke motion with your arms. I swear, mate. If you could find an old aid, RTK memoir, it's in there. You have to do a double backstroke. And that should hi- hopefully keep you at the top of the snow so it'd be easier to find when it all stops. But yeah. But yeah, you just got no control. That's mother nature. That's like, you know, it's like a tidal wave coming towards you. It's like you're, you're going to get ragdolled. And um, yeah, I think that's why. I think that's why. So just like, fucking hell, this is, no, I wasn't expecting this. But um, yeah, there was little sunballing was yeah, one of the other symptoms, actually, or signs of an avalanche. And I remember seeing, and the way they described it, it was like little balls of snow, like running down. And there was them running for, like, over the top of a ski, sort of coming down from the left, high left, low right. And I was just like, you know, boom. <laughs> Mm. I was like, oh my fucking god, we're going to go here. But yeah, it never happened. It never happened. But yeah, some, some lunatic actually trialed it, apparently. I think it was a French bloke. Put himself deliberately in a load of avalanches and tried different swimming strokes during during his time in the avalanche. And came out with, you know, the result was conclusions and recommendations. Randall. Do double backstroke. Randall. Whenever I think of uh, things like that, it always reminds me of the stories of when they when back in the second world war when they were trialing they being world military powers the axis forces the allies russia germany america uk were trialing testing the idea of dropping soldiers from planes onto the ground and the russians were the first ones to do climb onto the wings and just drop into snow drifts when they, without even any parachutes they would just jump oh, off yeah. the wings into snow drifts like, oh my god <laughs> they were, people were made of sterner stuff back then yeah. sterner stuff I think, well a combination of sterner stuff back then but also and also you were allowed to try more things yeah. so it was normal to put yourself closer to the limit of um, safety or, yeah. or death well, like than it is now safety. yeah because yeah. there's footage of the blokes Germans I think it was Germans climbing out onto the wings as well and just all go ready, set. And all Germans did it too, did they? Yeah. I think the Germans were the ones, I'm not sure they, they it was the Russians who jumped into the snowdrift. I'm pretty sure it was the Germans that were just climbing out onto the wings and like all at once, either wing, and all just letting go. They were just pulling their own chutes. And I think it was the Russians who dropped their blokes out in armoured vehicles as well, wasn't it? Under, under a lot, uh, not yeah, even on so. a medium stress platform. Yeah, I just think Just like so. a tank under a para- massive parachute and they were all dying as well. Just getting smashed inside it. Yeah. Yeah. On that, um, Coke was asking about Arnhem. So Coke's not ex-military. So, you see, so just a quick explanation of Arnhem. Um, Arnhem, uh, when, when, when we say Arnhem, or British military say Arnhem. In fact, American militaries are mostly airborne forces say Arnhem. It's uh, referring to um, Operation Market Garden, which is the, it was and still is the largest, the air, largest airborne military operation, offensive operation ever to take place, right? I can't remember how many tens of thousands of troops they dropped in, but uh, it was um, it was a, a mass, a, a ground on air operation and the air part was uh, market and the ground part was garden, wasn't it? Yeah, market garden. I think it was bigger, I think the bigger parachute uh, operation. The Germans. Oh, really? Maybe Crete. That might be... Really? Didn't they drop 30,000 or something? I get I'm not, I'm not... I might be getting mixed up. The story of Arnhem um, was chronicled well, multiple places, but it's most famous in the film Bridge Too Far, which uh, I highly recommend people watch. So that is Arnhem. Um, oh, yeah, and, and the, 80, the 80th anniversary has just gone past. I think the next time I'll go out will be the 85th. You've yeah. got to go out. I know you're saying on the icebreaker, you've you never done it. No. You've got to get out for the – it is incredible. I brought a – I went out for the 75th and brought a boot neck ladder or an ex-pool SFC guy out. He's right. a good friend of mine. And he was a bit apprehensive about coming. He said, I'm not ready. I'm like, boot neck. I said, Should I come? I said, mate. Get your ass out. We, we motorbiked out. It was a few of us going out. And he, oh he he was like bowled over by it. And I brought a Navy guy out this time around called Cy Piles, another, another good friend. And uh, he was the same. He's like, fucking hell, this is yeah. unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. What it was like, you know, just um, not just the, the the airborne community coming together for that. Yeah. We should do it for Normandy as well, but Arnold's the biggest one. But also the way the civvies get involved. Yeah. 
it's like everyone from the local area in Arnhem, in Nijmegen, and all the surrounding areas, they all they're all there to celebrate that once a year. Yeah. So it gets bigger than better. They're all flying the flags, you know, the the Pegasus flag and all the rest of it. Pretty incredible. Pretty yeah, incredible. I need to go, mate. I need to obviously I've been there. I went there but not during the uh, celebration. I went there with my missus a couple of years ago. But um yeah, it was pretty quiet. No, I do need to go there. I'll do it before I die. I have to put it on. A, I've not got a bucket list. Maybe I'll, I'll have to make one. And that'll be on it. Um, how, what's the process like? Being so releasing the book about um, your life and career. Uh, what was what? Not the process. What's it been like since releasing that book? Were you nervous when you put that on paper yeah. and an audio book then put it out? Yeah. What, so what did you do it for? Why? That one. That one because I've done some others and people were like. One of the books I did specifically called "You'd Be Nuts Too." Like one of the f- that was the first book I put out actually. Not the first one I wrote. It's called one, "You'd Be Nuts Too." I'll show you. And, um, that's um, that's the first one I, I actually. Oh yeah, put yeah, out. Yeah. And a lot, you know, to sort of, it got loads of good feedback, and it still gets good feedback. But uh, kind of one of the points that came back, like the negatives, if if you like, with people saying, "Oh, it's not," I thought it'd be chronological. They think it is more like a. A, a story, a chronological story. And I said, well, that's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be like a, the stories are grouped together. Um, and then there's a lot of stories in that, and there's a lot of stories in the one I did after that. Um, like, and they're more other people's stories. They're my stories. And I've got a load of other people's stories, and I've got all about power rage blokes, really, what they get up to. And um, yeah, and then I just I sort of that's let's write another one, and I did it in chronological order, and it just turned out like basically an autobiography. Hmm. And you think, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not obviously I'm not famous or anything, so you could you think, well, does anyone want to read your autobiography? But it's, it's like maybe and quite a lot of people have. So, yeah, but the- yeah, you're nervous putting any book out. You, I mean, you did your uh, a memoir, didn't you? I suppose you're nervous putting that out. Yeah, yeah, proper nervous. I wasn't. I hadn't been long been in the industry either. So it's like, who the fuck is this guy to be writing a book on? Plus Plus someone's going to be sniping at you, right? Someone's going to look yeah, at you. Yeah, who the fuck do the fuck? It wasn't too bad. Know? It was yeah. a couple of morons. But to be honest, at the time, I was a bit of a moron. Now I handle that stuff as well. All right. And um, could have handled it better. But uh, once it's out there, I suppose you got to go. You got to go out there now. Fuck it, it. Yeah, done. Yeah. Like, That's it. Yeah. Sit back. See what okay. happens. Yeah, I think you should only be concerned if the negative response is overwhelming. <laughs> you go, Ooh, yeah, you'd have maybe to have I've look. made a boo boo. There's always going to be negativity, but it should be on a small percentage. Can I read the blurb of this book? <laughs> Can I read the blurb of this? Yeah, mate. Right. <laughs> when your two earliest memories are of your brother being thrown against the wall by a drug crazed lunatic and the slaying of your pet dog. Oh, I read that as you slayed the pet dog. That's not the correct. It's not a good start. When you've been shot at, rocket bombed. Uh, shot at, rocketed, bombed, charged by elephants, had a parachute malfunction, and been chased by a six foot eleven wrestling legend. There's bound to be some psychological issues. Chased by a six foot eleven wrestling legend. You need to read it, mate. Giant haystacks. You know, but you will need to read it. Tell me the fucking I've story. Got by giant haystacks, mate. It's, um, I'm one of the few people I think. Who is it? Yeah. Giant haystacks. You're you're younger than me. You won't know who he is. I'll see, I'll see if I can. Do you want me to find it? Giant haystacks. There's a picture of him in there. It's, that's yeah. something I, uh, so I didn't realise when I wrote, did that book. The pictures didn't come out as good as like the other following book. Giant Haystacks was a legend in British wrestling. Right, right. go on. You had when I was little. You had Saturday, on Saturday mornings or Saturday afternoons probably. We used to have British wrestling on TV. There was only probably three, maybe four channels on the telly: BBC One, Two, ITV, maybe Channel Four. Yeah. And every weekend you'd have wrestling, English or British wrestling, and the two biggest names in it were Big Daddy. Right, these are two big, I remember fat, Big Daddy, yeah. Big Daddy, right? And Giant Haystacks, who was like the heel, you know, the bad guy. And Giant Haystacks was whatever I've written there, 6'11". I can't remember. You usually read it out, but he was absolutely fucking massive. And, of course, we're all just like, uh, wrestling's out of bollocks. Anyway, we, I used to be a, a roller skater, right? There's loads of us in Aylesbury. <laughs> And they'd be like, I know, I know what it sounds like, mate. <laughs> yeah, just leave. That's it. Right. Bye. It's, uh, but there was like a gang. Sometimes there'd be like 40 people ranging from like whatever age I was. You know, 20. Not yeah. really. I was like um, probably 14. And there was blokes there who were like 20, mid-20s, which sounds a bit weird now. There's some real hard, like local hard nuts in this like, gang, if you like. Anyway, we were skating around, probably about 15 of us or something like that, 10, 15, around the back of this place called the Civic Centre in Aylesbury it's been knocked down now but they'd done wrestling there that night and then we goes past I think it was old Fort Granada and then someone says oh look that's fucking giant haystacks in that car 
So we always kind of stopped. And there was a blonde woman in a passenger seat and giant haystacks in the front seat. He was massive. Joe, Ford Granada was a big car. And um, someone, someone's like, hey, haystacks, you fat bastard, I hope you lost. <laughs> and he's like, Mrs. Wan down the window. She's like, piss off, you little shit. And he's like, fuck off. And of course, we, was only, we all thought it was just a joke. He's probably a really nice guy. He's, you know, he's a big fat big fat bloke and he was getting proper pissed right so his missus had a go and one of blokes shut up you slag and all this and the bloke started having a go at her we were just kids and then he got he started getting really angry I fucking get my hands on you little shits and we're like fuck you hey stack we're like big daddy anyway you fat bastard and all this just being horrible to him and he got out of that car honestly I can still I can still hear it now he got out of that car right and the suspension just went went up about a foot and he just kept getting out. He was on the other side of the car to, to where we were. And it just went, and I, it went like, um, you won't remember, the $6 million man it was a TV show. And when he did something crazy, like he was like a bionic man. And when he <laughs> yeah, jumped yeah. over bridges, do you remember it? You can I know of the YouTube program. Now. Yeah. When he like jumped really high or something, he goes, wah, 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 and I was just jumping. <laughs> and that's how I, when I remember him doing it, that's why I, I even hear it. He goes, wah, 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 and we were like, what? Honestly, and we were all now skates, and we were just like, everyone went back while that pushing on each other, like, oh, fucking hell. And he was like, you look. And he was like, oh, fucking come over there and I'll get you. And we just all went back and we were like, fucking hell. And then, of course, we settled down a bit. Someone got brave and went, like, fuck off, you wanker. And then he started running towards us. Massive bloke, 40 stone, I think he was. And then we were just turned, mate. And everyone was like, ah, no one wants to be left behind. We are just, ah, and just bomb burst. Fucking legged it really quick. And he just roller skate, old school roller skate. And we were like, then we all just got around the corner. We were laughing. Going, Fucking hell, imagine if he got his hand on us. He's going to kill us. And it's all, let's go back. I was like, I don't want to go back. He's fucking proper pissed off. So we went back. We went back up on the car park, like second floor. And we were like leaning over the wall, shouting at him. Hey, Stax, you bastard. Fuck you, wanker. And we like, big daddy, kick your ass. How old were you? I reckon I was probably 14. Like <laughs> yeah. Bored 14 year old boys are lethal. Mate. Lethal. It was just that he was so aggressive and angry. And since I obviously, that, now I've actually met and trained with like, proper wrestlers uh, like in America and that. And I realized out there, you know, wrestlers are really fucking nails people. If he'd have got his hands on us, he would have killed us. Have you ever, so you've trained wrestling? Well, MMA, yeah. So wrestling. Okay, MMA, right, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I've, yeah, I've trained and sparred with loads of wrestlers and trained with wrestlers. Mm. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're really, and wrestling, wrestling is real, you know. It's like, you ever competed? No, no, no. I've done some, I've done some, I've done a few jujitsu matches and, um, some amateur MMA. But I didn't get into MMA till I was like 30, I think about this the other day, I was 32 or 30, probably 33 actually. Yeah, proper late, isn't it? So yeah. What, yeah, it is really. No, you know, I wasn't looking back on it. Didn't feel like it at the time. Why did you get into it? I got into it because I got posted out of, um, I didn't have time before, especially in the, in the pathfinders. I was just so busy all the time. And then when, you know, and UFC where people were talking a lot about UFC, it was just nowhere to train for one. And I had no, I had no time to train. Uh, just always away and always busy. And then when I got posted out of the brigade in 2007, you know, I was in a more of a steady kind of job as a survival, at the survival school. And I was like, I had, you know, I actually had some even, I had evenings off. It was pretty much nine to, not nine to five. It was pretty much Monday to Friday. So, you know, I could train in the, in the evening. So I, I, you know, I got back into doing some martial arts. I went to an MMA gym and got, that's when I started doing submissions, some grappling for the first time. And I, and I realized, shit, shit, I'm getting, I was getting smashed by the, you know, by the people who could do, uh, like we'd do, we might do starting, standing up and my punching and my kicking was all right. But as soon as you're like, right, wrestling as well now, I just like someone to pick me up and smash. And then, you're right, we're doing jujitsu now as well. And it's picked me up. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Jesus Christ. You know, it's just like overwhelming. I was like, what is this all about? So I really want, you know, that's how I got into, I don't know how I got into that, but that's, yeah, that's how I got into rest, wrestling. Yeah. And I've been to a few gym, MMA gyms around uh, in America and that and trained with different people and gone, gone up against wrestlers and you know, good wrestlers are, are males. Are you, are you still competing now? Nah, nah, I've not competed for a long time. I really don't, I don't get any, uh, I don't find it fun at all com- com- competing. The atmosphere in the sort of places. I did, I did my first few because I'd, I'd only been training for a few months at a gym called, um, South Coast Submissions in Gosport. And the coach there, bro- um, the coach there, Brian Adams, was like, all right, you said, how much do you weigh? And at the time, I think it was 87 kilos, something like that. 
So I said, like, 87. And he's like, can you get down to 84 by Saturday? And I was like, yeah. So I still had a mega fast metabolism then. I knew I could sh- shed weight easily. I was like, three kilos? Yeah, I could do that. He said, what? Do you want to compete on Saturday? And I was like, if you, if you, if you think I'm ready. He's like, yeah, you're ready. And I'd been training for four months, I think. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I did, um, right. Like, had a couple of MMA bouts and then a couple of weeks, probably a few months after that or a couple of months after that, did some more. Just did, yeah, did a few of them. And then moved, and then I was getting posted and move, you know, moving around, so training in different places. But yeah, I'd have to it's not really my thing, you know. I do it for more for sort of, I do like martial arts for more for like fitness, survival. Yeah. And I've got my club, I've got a club now, so I do it, you know, just it's part of my, part of my income. Oh, what, instructing, coaching. Coaching, yeah, yeah. Oh, quality. I mean, it's super important for mental resilience as well. Like, like I, I, um, I. One of the reasons I do fitness in general, and one of the reasons I box, uh, well, specifically box, because that in my area, the classes of the boxing club I go to, they line up with my time frames. I yeah. they have early morning sessions, they have late evening sessions. I can choose between. But most places, people, most places don't have early morning sessions. No. Um. Uh, but on a mental resilience front, so resilience front. So Coke there the, in the in the chat is saying that um, he he heard a Navy SEAL say that uh, the Navy SEAL said of the of the wrestlers um, he knew ninety percent of the wrestlers passed training, yeah. the SEAL training. So the question is from Coke: Do you think that uh, if someone's <coughs> got a wrestling background, they're likely to be able to pass PF selection or um, or or get into the reg? Well, the wrestling, wrestling in America and wrestling in the UK is so different. You know, they're, they're real athletes. You know, if they're like um, college wrestlers, like at, you know, at a, at a good level, they get beasted. They're training their nails and they're really. Why are they different here? Super it's fit. not the biggest sport. Yeah, because no one does it. I mean, catch wrestling comes from the UK, right? So, cat, I love catch wrestling. It's very different to. Hang on, hang on. My knowledge, my terminology knowledge of wrestling is zero. <laughs> Catch wrestling. What's catch wrestling? Catch, uh, catch is catch can. It's what basically what the catch you can catch as catch can is what is the full name of it. The short term, the short version is catch wrestling. Okay. But kind of, I think it's um, I think it started up in the Yorkshire mines. There's something like that. I'm not the best with my, with my history, <clears throat> but a bloke's the mines. Yeah, like with miners. Jesus. I'm pretty sure it's miners. And they, when they're on the piss in the pubs after after work, they'd have a scrap. And it'd be like right, you know, but it's submissions, so you can tap who out. They've got some na- catch wrestling's got some nasty, nasty submissions in it. Lots of neck cranks, loads of neck cranks. <coughs> a spine lock, you can't do like by the rules in most jiu-jitsu competitions, you can't do a lot of the stuff that you can in catch wrestling because it's not allowed to like, twist the neck in, the, in most jiu-jitsu competitions. But yeah, you know, I love all that stuff because it's like for me, it's like for especially like military combatives, it's great for that. In the films, they always break. They're just going like this, break someone's neck. Obviously, it's not that easy, but you can definitely compromise someone's spine using the good techniques. <clears throat> not like they do on the telly, but necessarily. But um, what do you mean on the telly? You mean like in the UFC? No, no, no. They're nails. No, no, they're awesome. No, no in um, like in uh, Jack Bauer or something, or James Bond. When oh, they break, right, when right, break right. someone's neck, they're just going to go like this, don't they? <laughs> yeah. They go like that and just go <laughs> yeah, yeah. dead. Yeah. What? But no, obviously that better not that can't happen because everyone would be dead at my gym. Do well, I was in depth, mate. Right? Do you remember a guy called? Do you know, what? I'm not going to name him actually. But I was in depth, but as PTI there, and you know, you think about, it, you think he was spinning in the yarn for us. He was just, le- he was just, he was just taking a piss, having a laugh at our expense almost. And yeah, when I was in, this is phase one as well. So phase one or phase two. Either way, anyway, we had a we had a PT lesson or part of a PT lesson, and it was uh, it was how to break a neck. Mm. And you think that you go <laughs> talking nonsense, absolutely talking nice. nonsense. He just showed us the motions of what you would do, and he was he was kind of big time in it, but not pretending he knew how to do it. It was just proper, you know, PTI having a laugh. Oh, right. And uh, but we didn't realise at the time. We all thought we knew how to snap a neck. <laughs> yeah, we all Is thought we knew in phase one how to snap a neck. Of course we weren't. I wonder, I wonder, you have to tell me after who that was. Yeah, that's a, that's a big misconception, actually, because a lot of people think that in the army they do a lot of self-defence or an armed combat, but yeah, it's not really touched, is it? And there's more there's more of it now, because obviously there's a lot more jiu-jitsu going on, especially. The army's got, the power has got a team. What, wrestling-wise? 
Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Oh, G- BJJ, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pirates have got the team. Marines have got the team. There's an army team, a navy team. You know, there's loads of it. Well, isn't the there. isn't the for the tri services champion Reg? Is he not Graham Finneran? He's out now, isn't he, Graham? Yeah, but he was. He, he might w- be, mate. Yeah, he's, you know, I'm sure he was yeah, too yeah. power. Was he not, Graham? He was too power. Yeah, yeah. He, he was the tri services champion, I think, for a while. Yeah, he might be. But he's definitely out. He's running a club. Well, I'm not sure he's run. Yeah, I think he's got his own gym. He's up north somewhere. I trained with him once. He gave me a lift actually to his club in. I can't remember where it was now. Yeah, was, he was a purple belt back then. I can't even remember if I had a belt. Yeah, I remember him as a purple belt when I first yeah. when he first he came out. Two patrols, wasn't he? I don't know, but he's he's West Midway, isn't he? he lives in West Midway, isn't he? Nah, I'm sure he's in North, not Yorkshire or something. Mate. Is he? Or Leeds or something. So what's the, so what's the club you got? Then? When did you start your club up, club up? Uh, started my club up maybe two years ago. I was doing some privates with people, just to, to, to kind of ask me from you know, after training, can you, you know, can you do some privates? I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And then, um, yeah, just got a few more people. And then when I got my black belt with my coach, I was like, you know, I was talking to him. And he basically endorsed me to set up a, like an affiliate club un, under him. So, which I, you know, I didn't see, didn't expect that. So I was mega, mega chuffed about that. So, yeah, I did that. So, Combat Athletics Academy un, under... My coach, Mark Tucker, he's Combat Athletics Academy, Liscard, like headquarters. Um, Wade Bridge and Nuki. Mm. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's, yeah, it's good, mate. I love it. I, I, like, I really like teaching. And we do a lot of like, combative stuff as well. So we do like knife knife defence and a lot of stuff that's kind of, uh, um, again, elite, you know, not, not competition friendly. More for self defence. And I do some women's self defence and that as well. I do that for a, like a community project in Nuki. I do some kids' classes as well. I've done some stuff for the school, the local school, because they had a load of um, strange men hanging around that the people, the kind of locals were quite worried about. The parents were quite worried about. And I was just like, I asked if I do that. I did that. But yeah, I like. Yeah, I really, I really like. I like the teachings. I really like teaching. I really like learning. And, uh, yeah, it's going all right, mate. It's going good. Why do you think it's not done in depot? Like I, I didn't do pro- I, well. We did some unarmed because Coke has asked us. We did some, we did some unarmed training. It was either in phase one or phase two. But I mean, it was like literally paid lip service to it. I think, yeah, we did nothing else other than that. Did you, did you do anything significant? No. Why you, do you mate. think? Why do you think it's not done then? Don't know. We did exactly the same as what you did. We did like a, a session on it, and it was. I don't even know if anyone was like qualified in any way to teach it. It's probably the same same stuff you got shown. Probably some Aikido or something. I don't know. Like, I can't even remember. Do you know what I think it is? I think it's. I think it's. It's that unlikely that you'd be in a situation where you're weaponless. Mm. That unlike uh, alive and weaponless. Yeah. That it's almost like should we bother spe- putting like a significant proportion of the training time. Yeah. On this recruit to this unarmed combat stuff. Yeah. When there's all this other stuff we need to be teaching, which is much more likely to happen. Maybe that's it. It could be that, and that would and that would be justifiable. What we what we what we brought in up at the Seer School and the survival, no, survival school when I was up there as the I think I was up as a training sergeant major by then. We used to we brought in combatives as like a conditioning class. Both before that they basically before they got went into interrogation they used to get run around doing like a stretcher race and they used to get a lot of injuries. It was just silly. Um, I was like, why don't we do something more productive? We want to still beat them. We just do some combatives. So we just like teach them more. It's more. It's more conceptual stuff. What it was, and it was um, yeah, an introduction to striking. Just, just to, for some people, it was the less. That by the end of the lesson, they just learn that they can't punch for toffee. Mm. That's it. So I don't. And the, the lesson, you know, the, the key learning point for them, if you like, was don't ever try and punch someone because you're fucking useless. That's why they come away with it because they're just pathetic, and they kind of learn that right there and then. For some other people, might learn. Oh, I can't punch with my left hand, or I can't strike with my right hand, or it's just not for me. They're just like hate it. I hate any sort of thought of violence. And but we'd also teach like a takedown, the conceptual a, a technique, but more about the concept of if someone attacks you with a knife, and then like a choke. I think you just did one choke just to show them, and maybe you get an interest, so, you know, trying to kick off an interest in them so they can learn more. And that was good. People loved it. Now the feedback on that was really good. We didn't. We very rarely got injuries. Uh, from people doing that. Yeah, every now and then someone would get choked unconscious just because they weren't doing what they were told, you know, tap it out. But, you know, obviously they'd wake up straight away. But, uh, you know, that, that was, um, that was good. You know, and, um, 
and I know there's a, there's a push to get more unarmed combat. There's like tactical jujitsu getting brought in. A few people are encouraging it. There's, there's more people doing, like especially BJJ now. It's quite popular. So you've got a lot of officers mm. and you know people who've gone up through the ranks endorsing it. So it's quite I a think matter the of time. fact that it's it's there's no striking with it is a is a real good um, incentive to get involved with it. Um, the lack of striking in it, but that doesn't make it any less potent uh, a weapon if you want. But do you subscribe to the opinion that um, the best martial art to learn is BJJ because, in inverted commas, um, most fights will go to the ground? <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. Uh, I don't think there's one. I don't think there's one, to be honest. If I had to, if you could pick three, Thai boxing, wrestling, and BJJ, that would be the three. Why Thai boxing? Because it's everything: elbows, knees, kicks, and punching. They're good, pretty good boxes. Box, yeah. Pure boxes are, are awesome, you know. And if, if, you, if you're not very good at grappling, and you think you're going to get a grap a boxer down and, and sub him, if he's a really good boxer, you're not going to get anywhere near him, and he's going to knock you out on the way in. You know, really good boxer. But if you're a really good at jujitsu and someone's not very good at boxing, you, if you get your hands on him, yeah, you, if you, if a grappler gets their hands on you, you don't know grappling. It's not going to end well for you. And no. I think people need to kind of accept that rather than go, I'll just do this or I'll just do that. It's just not that simple because you've you've done it. You've been humbled, no doubt. I've been humbled <laughs> many, many times. And I've been made to feel like a little like a, like a little baby, even when I've been training for years myself. Just people just smash you. Yeah. They absolutely destroy you. And you're like, fuck, if he was punching, if they wanted to, they'd punch your head off. You know, and I get it sometimes, to put like, cause, uh, especially like in a women's class where we do some jujitsu. It's, it's self defense based, but it's, it's morphed into more jujitsu because there's only so many times you can talk about eye gouging and kicking in the balls and all this sort of stuff. And you can't practice it anyway. So you might as well practice something. And the concept is, you know, my concept for the ladies or for anyone in self defense is, you know, tr- just try and go for, if you can, if the targets present themselves, a lot of eyes, the throat, the groin, attack it, but really attack it. Don't just try and poke it like that. Once this, I'm talking about get your thumb in there and really mm. scratch, 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 or we'll get your thumb in there and try and scoop it out and then uh, bite it or whatever and just do go fucking mental. Um, but yeah, the, like some of the girls they'll come in and say, Oh, I tried that thing you showed us last week on my husband, and he just said, just, I couldn't do it, he just did this, he just picked me up. And I'm like, That's you know, it's easy because you told him what you're going to do, and he just it's like, I say, right, Don't let me do it then, don't let me do it because you know what I'm going to try and do, don't let me do it. And you know, if they know you're just fo- focusing on one thing, it's quite easy to stop. So that's why people think they get kind of a bit misled. You know, if someone tried that jujitsu shit on me, I'd just kick them in the balls. And they'll kick you in the balls. I don't, you know, not just doing, ju- not just doing jujitsu. They're going to be kicking you in the balls as well. It's like, but yeah, Thai boxing. I, I, you know, I, I did, you know, training Thai boxing for you know a good few years. Really, really like Thai boxing. Savage. Thai, good Thai boxers. Thai boxers, Thai, right? Thai, right? The same thing. Yeah. yeah same yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, Coke saying you yeah, that uh, apparently Khabib, Khabib um, advocates for. BJJ yep. plus wrestling plus combat sambo. All oh, right. Have you tried combat sambo? No, combat sambo is like a, a, a Russian martial art, which is, you know, I've never done it. I know about it. I've always been into martial arts since I was a kid. Since I was very young, so I've always looked into different martial arts. But um, there's a lot of like, throws like judo. Um, there's lots of throws and there's lots of submissions in it as well. So it's quite, it's a re- it is really good. Mm. But you got, you know, there's... Um, you gotta have some. You gotta have. A, if you want, to, in my opinion, if, you need, if you're going to do a striking-based martial art, I'd use Thai boxing because this, this, they use punches, elbows, knees, and shins for kicking. So the only weapons. thing with the Thai boxes, I, I've, I've done a little bit on and off of Muay Thai several years ago, and then again recently. Oh, and yeah. I, I say a little bit. I mean, at my workplace. They've got a Muay Thai instructor here. Comes oh, yeah. in once a week and takes Muay Thai classes. He's oh, a right. he's a fighter himself. He's an Iranian dude, actually. He's a fighter himself. But these are classes for office folk, yeah. right? However, he does it mega. He's not soft. He's, he's really <laughs> good. So, but my only thing with Muay Thai is because he he's been picking me up with a few things, and one of the things he was picking me up on was basically I'm I'm punching like a boxer mm. and not like a Thai boxer, yeah. In that, I'm, I'm putting too much momentum into it. I'm carrying, I'm carrying my body through, like following the punch through, like I would in boxing, but it's exposing me 
to, it would expose me to fight to kicks, right. which I don't have to worry about. Yeah. So what he's basically ended up teaching me or telling me to do in his, in, yeah, teaching me to do when we're doing these sessions is li- basically light punching. Like, so it's, you know, less, less full body, more motion, less force behind it, which to me says less chance of knocking someone out with yeah. a fist. Yeah. With a fist. That's the only thing with, with that. But I think of all of it, I think people end up with, people who have not done anything before and want to do something. Mm. They can end up with, like analysis paralysis. Yeah. Uh, or all their friends are saying, yeah, jujitsu, 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 and they don't want to do it. Jujitsu, jujitsu, they don't want to do anything else because their friends are saying jujitsu. If you've done nothing else, I think you just start with anything. Yeah. Start with anything because you uh, can have these conversations about, oh, uh, will jujitsu beat boxing? Will, will combat sambo beat flipping Thai boxing? Whatever. It's almost always irrelevant if you get into a random scrap in the street or more than likely in a pub or something like that yep. because you're not going to be fighting someone who's like Pucker Jen trained up or something and or switched on at the same time you're pissed up you're literally just street fighting yeah. so any anything you've trained in is better than the yeah, alternative absolutely mate and plus I think I think knowing an art at any level I think it makes you less likely to engage in an actual scrap because mm. you, you're calmer. Yeah. It takes more for you to escalate yourself to the point where you want to use violence because you're more used to using violence and, and controlling your, adre- not controlling your adrenaline, but dealing with your adrenaline. Yeah. Does that make sense? We're yeah. making sense oh, yeah. Definitely, mate, yeah. And, you, and you've been humbled as well. That's the other thing. You realise that, you know, when I started doing MMA, it's like I realise that if someone's going to be a dick, if someone's better than you at boxing, say, or you're better than someone at boxing, you start taking a piss while sparring, boxing their ears off. And then the next round is wrestling. <laughs> and it turns out they're much better wrestling. you will get fucked up. You're going to get fucked up. Yeah. So it's like you, everyone starts screwing them up. Same with jiu-jitsu. It's like, but the good thing with jiu-jitsu, or well, one of the good things, there's loads of good things. I, I like all the martial arts, to be honest. But with jiu-jitsu, you, you can always tap. Whereas if someone's punching, I've been I've been to gyms before. I've just been looking at the time. I think, yeah, fuck me, when is this going to end? I'm just getting my ass kicked. It's just horrendous. You know what I mean? They're just much better than me. And I'm just like, fuck, you know, I want this to end. And I'm like, just quickly, slightly looking at the clock. Going, Jesus Christ, another minute. Get my head boxed off. But in jujitsu, if you you know if you're hurt, if somebody's hurting, you, you can tap. Right, so you don't have to. You know, you you can tap, and then you're, you're sure shit. They're going to tap you again. But you tap at that point before it gets really bad. You know, unless they're a dick, they'll let go. You know, and um, most, like my club, you know, we encourage a lot of coaching. <laughs> so if, you, if you're just smashing someone, someone new, for example, you could just smash them. You could just tap them out every 10 seconds probably if you wanted to. But you're not really going to learn. You're not taking anything away from that. You're just bullying someone really. So you're better off just trying to help them. So yeah. Just keep them off the camera. All right. All right. Um, why do you think? Why do you think the? Uh, why do you think the commu- I think why do you think the community and the camaraderie and the attitude between people in jujitsu is so different to most other um, combat sports? Do you think because it's not boxing similar? I think I've got very limited experience in terms of boxing gyms, but where I box seems similar in a way to jujitsu, but not similar in that close. It's, it's a tight group. It's a tight yep. club. That probably just a nuance for the club but it's definitely a different vibe to jiu-jitsu it must be the humbling side of things it must be the humbling side of things because it is different isn't it? jiu-jitsu yeah. clubs jiu-jitsu places are very different to the other kind of martial yeah a lot of the time they're pretty, pretty chill people are quite chilled out and why is that though why do you think I that know. is I don't know because a good mate of mine who's trained with he started he just we were, we trained MMA together for a, probably for a few years and he just decided he was just going to go boxing I, mean, I think about six months, six months, he just trained boxing. And I used to see him up in the gym, he'd be boxing. I'd be grabbed in or doing an MMA, but he was, in, he was just in the ring doing boxing. And, you know, and he got really good at boxing, you know, over that period. And he, and he was fighting as well. And um, but he was like telling me, oh, I said, so how's your training going? Oh, yeah, it's all right, mate. Yeah, and he was just telling me every, every week, he was telling me about how someone knocked him out in training. He's, and he's an L's, he's, he's an L's bloke. But he was just, you know, his boxing skills weren't up to, he was an MMA <coughs> fighter, mm. and these blokes were pure boxers, and their boxing was better. He was like, oh, this bloke knocked me out, and then, oh, yeah, and then this bloke knocked me out. I go, fucking hell, mate. I was like, is that normal? Is that normal getting knocked out in, like, in training? He's like, yeah. He's like, you yeah, know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new, so I get, really? I'm thinking, 
that's not good. It's no, like, that's not good. You don't choke people unconscious in jujitsu. I mean, you could do, but you just you, know, you choke till they tap, and <laughs> you put it on slowly as well. You know, you know. But I, I, I mean, I don't know because I've never been to a pure. I've never been to a pure boxing gym. But you know, obviously, a lot of box. They they are mad about boxing. They love boxing. You know, nothing, nothing wrong with that. But a lot of um, it's the same anyway. I think. It's probably still more in boxing from what I see and the people I'm, people I talk to where they still think that boxing's the best. For? For knocking, you know, for winning fights, for real, you know, for fighting. I'd be... I think where the streets, the streets, bruv, are concerned, mm. I'd be inclined to agree. Back to the point before was that the most, like, fights, street fights... They start and stop with the first or second or third punch, don't they? Yeah, they just it. don't get any further. No. Like yeah. if you could throw a punch, you probably if you could throw a punch, and you're used to, you know, be able to spot movement in the other person, you'll be able to see punches coming at you. Yep. You're probably going to win the fight. You know, someone who's been to a boxing gym, I don't know, four times ever, yep. recently, is going to almost certainly win the fight to someone who's never been, to, unless the other person is just some fucking street. Yeah, if he Killer. goes first, yeah. You know what I mean? That's yes, why I'm inclined to think. That's why I was asked. The, that's why I asked the question about BJA, BJJ earlier. Because I, yeah. when I was doing BJJ, I was, again, I did it very limited. I don't want to say like anything of any level whatsoever. When I was doing it, I used to think the same thing. Yeah, yeah, BJJ. Mm. It. Most fights have got to the ground. And, I think, and as I've gone, <laughs> I'm thinking, mm, I don't know. I don't think. They, most fights go to the ground, but only one person's going to the ground. <laughs> yeah. The other person's the victor. <laughs> yeah, I can't say. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've not had a real fight for a long time, but I, you know, I used to get in scraps quite a bit when I was uh, back in free para days. But I can't remember ever. What in battalion or in town? In town, yeah. <laughs> yeah I can't remember ever rolling around on the ground. But you know, it's it's it's, good, it's just good to know that. I mean, because you know, I can I can punch and I can, and I can kick, and I'm quite happy with that. You know, I'm not on the ninja, but my, you know, I, I, I've done enough of it. I can kick with both legs and I can punch with both hands. But with Jiu Jitsu, there's so much to learn. It depends on why you're doing it as well. There's so much to learn. And there's so much to learn in all martial arts. You know, you have, there's always going to be someone again. There's not to learn in boxing, of course there is. But you, there's so many different things you can do in Jiu Jitsu. And you can enjoy it. And after, it's really good for mental health, it's problem solving. There's just loads of benefits to it for me. Uh, and, and when I had to pick, basically, I just, I just couldn't keep doing, uh, I thought, I was doing striking, wrestling, and jujitsu, and I thought, you know, I ain't got, just ain't got time. Let's just focus on one, and I just picked. So I picked grappling, you know, submissions, jujitsu, because that's the one I enjoyed the most. Mm. It, it, I, I found it became very obsessive very quickly. Yeah. I was, if I wasn't doing it, in my spare time I was watching videos. Right, yeah. Um, I was like, because you can drill moves on your own, can't you? And uh, studying was so much on like when when i first started it was 2012 2013 2014 yeah. so, you know back then when i was trying to do it a lot and uh yeah it became fully obsessive like you said it's just so much to learn so yeah. much to learn no, and it was no, no, very no. much evolving at the time as well in terms of the, the the bjj awareness and community around the world yeah you know that's massive i think it's i think it's still supposed to be one of the fastest growing sports is it in the world it's um but yeah, I mean, down in Cornwall, obviously Cornwall's quite, quite rural, mostly. But we've got a few good, a few good clubs and some really good instructors. And um, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's growing. It's definitely growing. There's more competitions starting up around the place and more MMA going on. But um, yeah, I rec- I'd recommend, like you say, mate, any martial art. I, I think it's really good. Get your kids into it as well, and uh, you know. Like with a kids' class in jujitsu, it's a lot of playful stuff. You know, get them grappling. Don't you know? Don't let them do any cranks or anything dangerous like that. You know, try and keep it keep it under control. But it's good. The good thing about grappling, for me, is if you know if you get if you don't know grappling and I do, we can both punch. If you're a really good boxer, you're going to light me up. No doubt, no doubt about it. Okay, my boxing is average. But if if I get my hands on you, it's like. <laughs> I probably, it's probably, I'm probably going to win, right? Unless you're a grappler, and that's good because even like really big people, you just think. But then the downside to that is, and obviously, the counter argument is always: as soon as you're on the ground, mate, if someone's mucker just comes on and boots you straight in the head, and that's yeah. what happens. You know, it's like well, that's, that's the way I, the way I try and coach is and train is situation for 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 fighting, 
for self-defense, for survival, <laughs> more than it is for sport. So I'm like, if I take, you know, I'll, I'll say, because I've got some armed police and police, uh, and uh, one of my students is a, a Royal Marine. Um, I've got people from all over the place. And so they've got, they're doing it for different reasons. So I'll say, say to you in class, for you, mate, and I'll say to the police, you know, for, for you, this is a really good control position. You know, I'll be like this, and you can look around, you can use it, you can do this with one hand, get the other hand on your radio, or get your handcuffs with the other hand, you can call people over, you, 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 help me. You know, and I'll, talk, I'll talk about stuff like that. You know, if it's girls, it's like, you know, they're, their main problem might be um, like sexual assault. So they might want to focus on stuff from the back. And how do I get out of this position? And it's like right from here, you want to be focusing on that, on this. But at the same time, I'd be like, look, if the bloke's there, just get your thumb and ram it in his eye, up to the elbow, I always say. Get your thumb in his eye, up to the elbow. Um, you know. But on top of that, it's good to know some actual techniques as well. Do you remember your first street fight? No. No, I mean, I had quite a lot of fights when I was little, so... Um, well, what about as an adult, though? First as an adult? First one as an adult would probably... Something when I've, when I, when I've decided I would be an adult. No, mate, to be honest. I, was, I mean, I, was, I, had a lot, I had quite a lot of scraps when I was like, young, because we moved around a lot. So I was, And then, of course... Pre-military? We, yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm talking... Um, age seven and onwards and then um, yeah when I was in I had, I had quite a lot of scraps mainly in Dover with Free Power because I was you know that was my kind of glory years of going out drinking and that, going out with the blokes and there was all them uh, people said we were in, we in Dover here with Free Power Nah, I went down and visited down there one power down there when, when a couple of times oh yeah because one power took over okay, yeah. but, on, but on the subject Coax asked the question like was it was it was it um was it like no, was it normal for power edge blokes to get in fights on nights out? I, I wouldn't say it was. Not any more than anyone else in the military. I don't think. It, it all yeah. depends what was going down. It, yeah. It's like you had the groups as hand grenades, didn't you? Yeah. It kind of. Right. It's in fact. In fact, it's kind of like the same as same as. Um, you probably had the same sort of ratio of people who are likely to get into a scrap than not as you do in Civvy Street in the military. Yeah, probably. You reckon? I, I, yeah, I reckon. Probably. I think it's just. Yeah. Just, you attract it more because you're military. And if people yeah. know you're military, they're inclined to want to scrap you. It's a weird thing. So you talked about you know, that wrestler earlier who's like six foot eleven. My uncle's six foot nine and he's a unit. Oh, yeah. He used to be playing American football. Unit UK, like he's a unit, man. And the biggest bloke I, I know in terms of he's, he's the tallest guy I know, but he's also <laughs> I mean he's hand like fucking spades. He'd be yeah. like that wrestler. He's just he's just a giant. Nice as pie. Yeah. Like wouldn't hurt to fly. Whenever he goes out drinking, it's almost certain someone's going to start on him because you get some pisshead, yeah. idiot, who got a chip in his shoulder or some insecurity, see the yeah. biggest guy in the room, feel like he's a threat, my uncle, feel like he's a threat, and then go over and start, yeah. start windmilling. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing when you get a group of civ civvy guys all having a drink, they spot an ex-military guy, and it can kind of escalate from there, really yeah. common in, in the... In the what well, was Dover like that, was it? Yeah, Dover was Dover was funny because <laughs> yeah, you know, I think what happened. I had a, actually had a mate I was in school with who was in the Green Jackets before, and they were in the unit before we were there. And he was, he, he, I saw him on leave, and he was telling me about these like, people coming down squatty bashing. And I was like, what? I just couldn't get my head around that thing. That fucking thing happening when you get there, mate. And he was like, oh yeah, we have we get loads of trouble with the civvies and that. I was thinking, oh. anyway, they kind of they there was a pissing contest when we got down there. That's what I, I, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'd been in battalion. I'd only been in battalion a couple of years. But when we got down there, there was a lot of, there was loads of people who would like, a lot of them were northerners, and they were coming down, going on a ferry, popping over to France, getting loads and loads of cigarettes and alcohol, and then suddenly, you, you, you just get <coughs> dead cheap on the ferry. And they'd take it back, obviously double their money or whatever up north, and they'd come out, they'd be out on the piss sometimes. And they'd kind of establish themselves in, in Dover. And the doormen were trying to be dicks as well. And it weren't long, probably six months or so. All the doormen were free para. Because no one else could stop, no one else could just stop the blokes. And the blo doormen would get involved and the blokes would just be like, oh, fucking doormen trying to fill him. Boom. Smack. Happened in Collie, didn't it? When the blokes moved to Collie, to and free para. They had loads of scraps, bad, bad, loads of people. But it's just people kicking off with them, trying to treat them like shit. And they're just like, no, not having that. But yeah, we had, uh, yeah, we did have a lot of fights. Yeah, you know, so it was a good crack, you know, we young blokes and that. But um, 
yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of fights, but then it kind of just it settled down quite a while, quite a bit after it was established who was who was in charge. You know, <laughs> this is just like dominating the area really. But there was some, I mean, there were some nails blokes in Freeport. There were some nails blokes, and they would I see a bloke who were, I've written about this, and it might be that one. A uh, bloke called Taft Bloodworth, and he, he, I just we, we were on QO. We Taft Bloodworth. Yeah, do you know? that's not his real name, is it? Is his that his name's, his real name? His name. Uh, his name's Steve. Steve Bloodworth. Steve Bloodworth. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. He's, 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 I, d- I didn't mean to. I meant the surname wasn't the real name. I know. Oh, no, that's his, his name. Yeah, that's his name. <laughs> that's his name. He was a mega bloke. He really looked after me. He was. A, he was a. I think he was a senior Tom in one, but he looked old, like old school, boxer's nose and that. He looked nails. He looked after me actually when I went to Wampatoon in Free Para. I just made sure I didn't get bullied and stuff. And um, he was a good bloke. But yeah, we were, all, we were all in the card room in Dover. And the B- BOS came in, the battalion orderly sergeant, who happened to be a not, not a power edge bloke. I think he was. He was a, I think he was a clerk. But he was dressed in number twos. Because they used had this like presence thing where they used to send the, the BOS to go downtown with one of the blokes and go around the pubs. Because Dover was like up in arms about a power battalion coming down. They really didn't want it. So anyway, they kept this up for a while. You know, he came, oh, I was fucking he was flapping. He's kicking off downtown. I need, I need four blokes. And we were, everyone was just like, fucking me, me, me. So we jumped in this Land Rover, bombed downtown. He was just kicking off, loads of screaming. Goes around the charcoal grill to kebab shop where there's fights pretty much every night. And uh, you could just see tough blood over there. And he ripped off his top. He was going, ah, just shouting. And the blokes, the bloke ran at him. This, the first bloke ran at him. Boom, dropped this bloke. The velociraptors, the two, like a couple of the other blokes, one or two blokes just appeared from the shadows, dragged this bloke off, you know, and just like, boom, give him some more. Next bloke runs at Taff, boom, knocks him, drops him. The bloke's sort of like, and it was just like mass brawl. But he must have tr- dropped, as I remember it, he dropped like four blokes, just bang, <laughs> bang, bang, bang. And we were there in uniform, and this bloke was in his number two, his medals, that. And this woman shout, looked at me and goes, Can't you going to stop him? She was like, I think one of the blokes was her boyfriend. I just said, you fucking try and stop him. I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, I knew him. I was just like, no, let him carry on. Then they would, they would gobbing off, you know, what are you going to have, fucking parawanker and all this? And he's just like, and they'd, you know, they'd think, oh, I'll, I'll do it this time, I'll get him. And he was just having none of it, mate. Bang. And then we see, heard the sirens and the blue lights, see the blue lights flashing off the walls. I'm like, all right, Taff, Taff, come on. Let's go, go, go. And I grabbed him, chucked him in the back of the Land Rover by outside the Elephant and Hind, which is like the, the main pub where all the blokes drink. There's a fountain. We parked right in between the pub and a fountain. And then um, well, dropped the flap down and out. We said, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go. And this BOS was in the front going, what's going on, what's going on? We are going, fucking nothing, nothing. Let's go, go, go. And then a the copper just came to the back, lifted up the fucking flap that was hanging down. And we were just sat there in the back of the road like this, looking all innocent. And said, what's going on in here then? No, no, nothing, nothing. And he went, who's that? And <laughs> Taff was like, just sort of hiding in the, in the bottom of the foot of the back of the Land Rover, just curled up. And he was like, who's that? No, no one. And he went, get him up to camp now. I went, all right, cheers. He, didn't, he, just, he knew what was going on, but they liked it. You know, because a few of the blokes knew, got to know some of the coppers, and they, they loved it, the power re- re- regiment they're sorting it out, because there's so many scumbags in that town. Yeah. I wish I could, I wish I was able to... Um go and see what the other battalions were like in, the, in, in those years because you know when you you don't realise the the environment you were living in and working in until later on. I met up with an old I met up with an old platoon because it, it normalised it's it's just normal to you. So the only, the only thing I've ever known was three para, right? Yep. You know, and and in that environment. And uh did some limited stuff with the other battalions, but not enough to spend enough time to form an opinion on what, you know, culturally it was like. Well, I sort of a little bit, I formed a little bit of opinion on true power. Fucking straight blokes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I met up with an old tune commander maybe two years ago. And we had a chat and he was describing, he was describing it. Uh, he'd moved about between units, I think. And it, he was describing three para. So his time in three para was kind of 04 to 04 through to, I think it was 08, 09, maybe. Uh, he was a mega platoon commander. 
um, I was 2000 to 2011. You were what, 90? 94 is my first name. 94 to 99. And he described it as um, the the most alpha dominated environment he'd ever, uh, the most alpha saturated environment he'd ever he'd ever been around. And he wasn't particular to any particular company. He was just in general. He was describing three paras, just to, this this place where it was just all it was all egos and capability. Mm. Um, it was also because of the time, yeah. that period of time as well. And uh, and I remember when I joined into when I first came to Italian, like I think it was January two thousand and one, uh, and fucking frightening. Mm. It was just like uh, oh, again. God. I think it was like, after depot was there. You get like a shock of capture. You think, oh, yeah, I've done it now. Oh, it's going to be easy, and it wasn't. The hardest stuff I ever did was in battalion. Mm. You know, on operations and and back in the U- in the UK. But the characters, mate, were just frightening. Like when I came, came up, Mark Reed, for example, is one of the senior charms. You know, Mark. Yeah, no, Mark. Mark was one of the one of the senior charms. You had um, uh, another guy called. Russ, I won't say his surname because he went on to other units. No, no, Russ. Yeah. Russ, yeah, I had him, and um, and, and and all these other like sort of three para household names like yep. Dan Jarvey and people like this. Yeah, like Dan. Yeah, yeah, he, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and Tiddy. You talking about Tiddy earlier, yep. and all these characters, and it, and and when he when the Chun Commander described it as that, I thought, fucking hell, yeah, it was mm. literally like. It was just pure testosterone. Yeah. Pure testosterone. And it was a case where, you know, if you, it, it was clear what you were supposed to do and what was expected of you in the position you were in, regardless of which section of the two and company you were in within the battalion. Yeah. And it was clear that if you didn't do what you were told to do, it was going to be responded to predominantly with violence in the first instance. Yeah. The first instance <laughs> was not a disciplinary procedure yeah. by the book. The first instance was, violence mm. to teach you quick you shouldn't have done that because that's lazy or that's jack or that's the wrong tactical thing to do or that is not what i told you to do yep. you've done something else and it would be like violence yeah. and i don't really have anything against that mm. at all because it, as long as it's judged properly as in i says as long as it's judged properly violence isn't the response to every single situation no. But for quite a lot of them, it is the response. Because one of the things particular to the military is if you've got a, someone who could be a bad apple in your unit or someone who needs to learn quick and isn't learning quick enough, you, it's not simply a case of you can remove them from the unit. It's quite often, let's say it's a fire team or a section or a platoon or a company, it's very difficult to remove that individual to a different company quickly. Oh, yeah. You have to, they, if you're a section commander or, or a 2IC or you're a senior top and that person's in there and they're a liability, you can't go, hey, can we get rid of this guy because he's not good. You have to teach that person quick. Yeah. And quite often when you're dealing with adults who aren't responding to normal instruction, violence is a really, real quick way oh, yeah. to teach them the area of their ways. Yep. Yeah, you know, I was, and I'm, I'm saying that from a position of, I was a victim of that. I was a victim, wrong fucking word, a victim. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, yeah, so that, you know, that happened to me. Yeah. And, and I enacted it as well, you know, and, and I'm, I'm better off for it. There were circumstances where, especially in depot, for example, where violence was definitely not required to teach me what the problem was. Um, but it happened. Yep. And other times it was absolutely the, the, the right thing. Um, the problem is, with it is, is it's really difficult to police. And it's really easy to get the wrong people enacting far too much violence mm. uh, unnecessarily and it going on to a, like a level of bullying. Yeah, of course. You know, mental. But they were, uh, until he said that, I hadn't realised, thought, yeah. And I think across across the board in the military, it must be softened up because of the clamp down on things like liberal use of violence to teach people the area of their ways, for example. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I'm really reluctant to ever say things have changed, to be honest. Because I, 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 I never want to be that bloke. I've always been mega conscious of it. I, never, I don't want to be that bloke who's, who's like, it was harder in the old days. Or, yeah, that that bloke. So I'll never be that bloke. Different. Maybe things could be different. But yeah, it probably has. There, there might well be less violence because everyone's video and everything now. That's one of the and, and people understand that you can't. People are more, more educated. But, you know. 
Yeah, we had a bit. We had we had a couple. Of, we had a bit of violence in depot. I definitely saw some violence in in free para. You know, and uh, and I've, I've used I've, yeah, not in, on courses mainly. You know, I've used violence against you know other pe other people to get because they're just really like you say they're not they're just it's just not sinking in. You say, what are you fucking doing, mate? And it's just good. the only way for them to learn is to get shaken up a little bit. But yeah, I've never, you know, I've never used, uh, never had to use it against my own blokes or anything like that. But yeah, mainly on courses. But I used to be very anti, like anyone who went power edge. I was a real nightmare for it. I didn't, I wouldn't talk to anyone or anything. What do you mean? Sorry. After depot, I, I was really like mega. You know, just a lot of blokes, a lot of blokes. When I said I was going to Pathfinders, a lot of my close mates were like, you, you, you can't go there because there's not <laughs> the blokes who ain't power edge there. You, you won't like it. I hate it. More about the, you know, the non power edge blokes. Like, oh, you can say the word. Say the word. Say <laughs> yeah. the word for non power yeah, edge blokes. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well you, terrible, it's hats, right? But mm. the polite the polite way to say it is non ferocious. Non ferocious, yeah. This is But like, we don't say that on this podcast. I've got a I think it's in this one. I've got a table of terminology about things like that. But um yeah, I used to I I really did. Up until it took me a long time actually. But I didn't yeah, I, at one point I remember I hate I just, as far as I was concerned, I hated civvies and I hated hats. And I, re I really meant it, you know. I really felt that way, and it wasn't just bravado. I know, I know, I know. It wasn't just me. It was just like that's that's to me. That was the way. That's what a paratrooper was like. <clears throat> and I didn't want. I just didn't want to talk to anyone who went power edge. But the mindset makes sense, mm. and that mindset, and that it does make sense. I think if to to bring about the culture that you want to have to um, be able to demonstrate elite capability, right? That's right yeah. But the important thing with it is, is that it, it shouldn't inhibit your ability to integrate and work with other units. Mm. Right? That's it, and that's when you go through the ranks. Yeah. You got to grow up. As, but yeah, some people don't. Yeah, through the ranks. Grow. But also, I mean, I I don't know what it was like for you. We, we served at slightly different times, but we sort of I came after you left. But when we went on operations. All right. If people got attached to us, other units for whatever specialty, be that be that military police, or military police, or be it you know, um, I don't know, ATO, or be yeah. it you know, en yeah, engineers, or be it you no know, civil engagement team, whatever, flipping six debt or whatever. Yep. They were welcomed in yeah. as part of the unit. They were looked after as well as the reg blokes. Yeah. It didn't mean we loved them. <laughs> it definitely didn't mean we loved them. But they were welcomed in because it's recognised that they played a part. They were yeah. they were a part of the machine, and we needed them to be able to achieve the mission. Yeah, you know, and and I think uh, that is definitely a common mis misconception um, that people have. We're looking outside into power edges that we hate everyone and we won't work with them. It's to totally incorrect. Mm. You look at you look at. Um, most of the people who have been attached to us on operations will say it was a great time. Right. And I'm not, this is not me just pulling out of my ass. I know because I've, you know, I've, I've seen it and heard it over, yeah, over same. the years, same. which speaks volumes, but also it's interesting when you, when you, when you weigh that up against the, yeah, we well, hate Hudson civvies because it was definitely the mindset, but I think it was necessary, necessary. Yeah. And what? I think other units have the same thing. It's just not to the extreme. Yeah, probably. With the exception of SF, maybe. What was PF like? You were there mate. with Ben Garber, weren't you? Yeah. 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 Not for, I don't think me and Ben were there for that long together. I can't remember. I think his card was, might have been like the last card before I left and went off to the survival school. It was like 2006, something like that, maybe he went He went there. No, hang on. Yeah, he might have done. Oh, Ben Hereford. Yeah, it was 06, something like that. Yeah, yeah is it, mate? I don't, I'm not sure if he went to, um, I can't remember if he was on that Herrick with us or not. I think he came after that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'd have to look through some photos. But yeah, it was good, mate. It humbled me, to be fair, because well, I was in three pair of SIGs and I, I thought I was pretty good with comms. But then I went to PF and there's blokes here from the SIGs, Royal Signal, uh -huh. 216. They're good blokes. Some of them were really good, mate. One of them is still a really good, mate, of mine now. But they were really, really good, you know, at comms, like strategic comms now, whereas I was, you know, tactical comms maybe. <coughs> but they were better and they knew loads of stuff I didn't know. And I was like, oh, fuck. What? No talking about stuff and I thought, yeah, I'm pretty good with comms, mate, you know. Well <laughs> oh, actually. I'm not saying the battalions ain't good at comms, but the level I was at, they were they were well beyond. And I was like, fuck it now. 
and I was learning loads of them. Same with like the engineers, you know, they knew loads about demolition. That I, I didn't understand. I didn't know. And if I ever, if 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 a, if a task came up, I'd just go, "This is a bug built me, mate, or bug my pay scale, mate." Call one of them, like Remy blokes, with some really good lads, and they're brilliant. You know, when a wagon spanks in, you don't have to wait for someone else to fix it. Yeah. So it's mega. And I just, it really, yeah, really, it, it uh, educated me. And sort of brought me, um, made me realise that there's good people everywhere. There's good people everywhere. But as a Tom, as a, as a young private, you know, I think I was a really good product because, you know, I was like, um, that's what you need. You need some, like, you need these little nutters who are just going to, you tell them to run at that machine gun position, they're going to do it. And I was like that. You know, I'd have done whatever the corporal told me to do. I'd have done it. And, you know, I'm sure you would have done as well as a Tom. And as a sergeant or a corporal, it's great to know your blokes are like that. But when you're going up through the ranks, you can't just keep acting like that, like you hate everybody. Because oh, no. the more people you actually meet, and when you talk to them, you're like, oh, he's all right. And the bloke goes, yeah, he's all right. Like, what are you talking to? I used to be like, what are you talking to hats for? And I used to grip people. What are you talking to fucking hats? I'm like, oh, he's all right, mate. And I said, no, he ain't. He's not. He's not all right. He's a fucking hat. Don't talk to him. <laughs> I remember one course. I'm serious. That's extreme. I had one bloke, yeah, on, on my uh, PTI course, there's a lad. I didn't really know him that well. I've been in about, what year was this? I've been in, say, four years, something like that. And this lad had been in probably a year in a different company to me, and he kept talking to people from other other, other cat badges. And I, said, I called him over because we had a little blood clot. Why are you talking to them like? We're we're all over here, and you're fucking over there. He's like, well, he's all right, mate. He's you know, he's fucking ain't all right, mate. He's a fucking hat. Don't talk to him. And he's like, I'm I bet I think I'm old enough to decide who I talk to, Steve. I said, obviously not. Fucking come over here. <laughs> I was just like, I really, really got wound up by it. I don't give. You know, I grew out of it. Yeah. Some some there's a few people I know who never did. But um, that's what I was like then. But I don't there's, regret there's that. People in Civvy Street don't, are still doing it. That's true. People man, yeah. in Civvy Street are still doing it. Crazy. Um, question for, uh, so I've got a question, great question here from Coke. Um, uh, how much of a step out was soldiering in PF compared to soldiering in, uh, in the battalions? It's just different. It's just different. Step up. Is, is that the question? Yeah, how much of a step, step up, up was soldiering in PF? Yeah. Um, it's, I'd say... <sighs> Is it a step up or a step sideways? I don't know. It's like you go, it's a, you spe, you you you're specialising. Yeah, you're specialising. Yeah, you could say you're specialising in patrols and you just. I say yeah. It probably is. I'd say it's a, it is a progression, but I'm not. I, I'd never say that the a soldier in the PF is better than a soldier. I wouldn't just say every soldier in PF is better than every soldier in Free Power. It's not true. I've got some. Me- I know some mega mega blokes who've never gone picked for PF, never gone for patrols. Never gone for SF selection, and they're just amazing soldiers. Yeah. I need you to explain, please, when you're saying patrols. So, Sivvy is maybe listening and thinking, patrols? Yep. I'm just walking with a weapon. So, describe what you mean when you say patrols, because we referenced on the icebreaker, we re- no, no, I think before the podcast, we referenced patrols platoon. You've just referenced patrols in Pathfinders. Yep. You've, That's so, true, of course, yeah. Yeah, explain, explain it for me. Yeah, so patrols platoon, and uh, in each battalion has got their own. Patrol teams are reconnaissance platoon, so they're they're like the lead reconnaissance element for the battalion. And then in the pathfinders, the pathfinders are the lead reconnaissance for the brigade. So it's just it's just it's a scaling really. Um, you know, you might go out on a reconnaissance patrol as a, as a rifleman in a rifle company. You could go and do a reconnaissance patrol. That's just that's not your speciality. Your speciality is section attacks in a recce platoon or a patrols platoon. Your speciality is carrying out reconnaissance for the battalion. And if you go to Pathfinders, you'll specialize, you know, your special skill is reconnaissance for the brigade. So it's, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's just a, a level, I suppose. But yeah, there's some mega, mega, mega soldiers in, in Free Power. And I, I always thought, to be fair, and I've written about this uh, a couple of times, I think, for me, the best soldiers, are, the best soldiers I've ever met have been the blokes who spent loads of time in the rifle companies. And, went, and, I, and I saw that more when I went on seniors. Because seniors was a big learning curve for me, you know. I don't mind admitting it. So I've been out. I've been out of uh, a rough company for a long time. I only did like a year in free a company free power, and then I went to the SIGs, and then I went to Pathfinders. And um, yeah, I hadn't done like uh, company attacks and things like that for a long, long time. So it was a big learning curve for me. But uh, you know, the blokes who'd just done all their time in the rough companies, it was easy, easy for them. Piece of piss. It was second nature. Whereas for me, it wasn't second nature. You know, I had to, I had to think. Um, yeah, back to basics. Juniors and juniors and seniors. So, yeah. so um, for those listening, yeah, juniors is it, the command courses. Juniors is junior, junior section battle, junior section battle 
Commander's course. <laughs> JSPC. It's SCBC. JCBC. Section Commander's Battle Course. Section, SCBC. J- yeah. Junior Section. I don't know about. <laughs> Section Commander's Battle Course and Platoon Sergeant's Battle Course. So it's That's S- right. Yeah, SCBC and PSBC, juniors and seniors. Yeah, yeah like c- command call, uh, yeah, command yeah. tactics courses to um, to make you eligible for promotion. But um, when I was on juniors and seniors, there was uh, there was a, cu- a couple of Hereford lads on each on each of them who had come to get the tick in the box. Mm. But they loved it. The time they loved it. I won't name the guys wrong because you'll probably know mm. most of them. Um, but they loved it because I think because they were doing this, their bread and butter again, which yeah. they probably hadn't done properly like that is in, in the training, uh, in the training capacity since before they went to Hereford. Yeah, you know, do the stuff they joined up for. I mean, it's horrible, but mm. it's also so good. You know, you come back from those courses and you just feel like on top of the world yeah. in terms of capability. One, thank fuck, that I'm course sorry, is over. Yeah. You know, and um, and two, you just uh, more knowledgeable and competent, and uh, confident with uh, executing those tactics on on the yeah. ground. Yeah, you had a you had a, a section in your book open earlier. I think you were going to reference. Have we gone past that point? What were you going uh, to? Probably, yeah. It's just uh, that. What was it? about that? That's, I meant to say that, it to you ten minutes ago. That scrap. That's for the. That's isn't it? That the Bloodworth bloodbath. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That name's just the same Blood story, mate. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. just there's something. <laughs> Most of the stories in this are like three or four pages long. This is little, little anecdotes like that, really. What What drove you to write the um, the latest one, the one that you sent me, and that is uh, Majority Report. Yeah. So that's. If I would it be accurate to describe that as a sort of your commentary and opinion on like social social issues at the moment? Yeah, that's not yeah because to categorise it, you have to categorise it when you load it up onto um, Amazon. Yeah, it's quite a difficult difficult one to categorise. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so yeah, social constructs. Yeah, society, Ooh, social so modern, constructs. Yeah, modern society. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there, mate. It's, it's gender a social construct, Steve. <laughs> Well, yeah, I've written about that, mate. I've written quite a lot Have about you? that. Yeah, I've Go written on. about all these things, all these things that uh, no one, you know, that if they especially if like the cameras are off and you're having a few pints with a with with someone, and, and you quite quickly normally get onto once you realise you, you know, they're all right. You, there's certain topics that we all end up talking about, but you wouldn't necessarily just start a conversation with someone you didn't know off straight off the bat. You would do if they're power edge you can pretty much be assured that, that they'd be on the same wavelength. Mm. But there's quite a few. There's like racism, slavery, uh, gender, toxic masculinity. There's like, all, and I've written about basically all these all these things. You know, men breastfeeding, um, the cultural thing is appropriation. Most of these is, all the thing is with most of these is, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think most people, let's just say the UK, I think most people in the UK think probably what you think yeah. on the opinion of these things. Yeah. Right? So are, yeah. However, what is presented in the media mm. um as as the general consensus is as they, they present what they think is the general consensus, they seem to present uh, it's a much more fifty fifty opinion on things like gender as a social construct. Yeah. Or um, you know, anything to do with race, anything to do with uh um, transgenderism, anything yeah. to do with uh, mass immigration. Yeah, borders are a social construct. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, people. exactly. Um, so I think uh, it's, it's, it's always like they try to make it a taboo subject when it shouldn't mm. be. When it shouldn't. No, be. They, they make it a divisive subject when it shouldn't be. Um, yeah. you've got your opinion. Just say it out loud. Just, um, as long as you're not, as long as you're not attacking anyone. Uh, or being, you know, as long as you're not being extreme right or extreme or whatever that is, extreme left. It's good to be, it's good to encourage the openness with it as well because it does, because by speaking about stuff like this, it does very quickly expose the people who are inherently bad. Mm. You know, if you want to have a conversation about race, uh, let's say, I don't know, let's say racial discrimination or no. uh, colonialism strokes and slavery connected with that, making connections there, then you and I could have an, a, a, like an objective conversation with that. I know there are some people I could invite into that conversation. 
and they would expose themselves very quickly as having very little understanding of the actual topic at hand, yeah. but very easily expose themselves as just downright racist. Mm. Like literally a person who doesn't like someone else because of the colour of their skin. Yeah. Like the, the 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 very definition of racism. Yeah. But if you clamp down on these things and don't and don't allow conversation about them, mm. you can't you don't expose those people. They can hide away. That's it. And yeah. it and it sort of also stokes the flames, I think, a little bit. Yeah, of course. You know? Yeah, should people you should be allowed to say well you know, it's sort of free speech. And I've written up you know, I've written about that quite a lot. Because my mum always used to tell me, you know, soldiers die so you can have free speech. Soldiers die. So she was really always, um, she'd massive. She, she used to give me a lot of grief because I didn't used to vote. And I said to her, I don't really know. I don't look into politics enough. I don't know enough about it. It'd just be, I'd just be picking the one that you told me to pick. So I was like, I can't make an educated uh, vote, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to. She used to give me grief then. Soldiers died so you could vote. Soldiers died so you got freedom of speech. But yeah, you know, freedom of speech is very limited now. You can only speak speak freely about certain things, and other things you can't speak freely about at all. So it's not free. I think that's a misconception. I think if if we cracked on and just spoke our mind, not spoke our minds. If we cracked on, I've, I've been doing the last ten years. Everyone did, and then it would be very difficult to clamp down on it further. Hmm. I think you know it's like um, what's the word? We are being it's it's uh it's very underhand, subtle, clamp down on speech, most of it without enacting enacting actual any laws, mm. you're making it socially unacceptable yep. to mention such things. Yep. You know. Even referencing the colour of someone's skin. Yeah. Even referencing um anything negative to do with immigration. Yeah. You know, is society so, so socially unacceptable, which means you can't discuss it. Yeah, which is a fucking major problem. It's just crazy, you, should, you know. Like you say, sometimes the colour of someone's skin is like the most. Like when I was a kid, this is, again, this is this is stuff I'm writing about or written about. When I was a kid, especially where I was brought up, it's really multicultural, and we were told that skin colour doesn't matter. It's just irrelevant, and that's what everyone kind of went along with. Half my you know, all my friends were from all different backgrounds, races, and religions. No one really cared about it. It's just. Yeah, he's black, he's brown, whatever. No, no, no one cared. He's a Muslim, he's a Hindu. I've got mates from all, 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 all over the place. But now it's like, um, it seems to be like priority. Sometimes it's priority information. It's like, the, it's the most important thing about someone. Like he's, uh, like someone's gay, or whatever. And it's like, so what? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Who cares? I don't care. Or, um, you know, someone's trans. And they, you know, they want to tell you the pronouns, or you're expected to learn the pronouns. So, I don't care. You know, I don't care what you are. I'm not going to tell you mine. It's pretty fucking obvious. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very difficult. So, you know, when, when, when apparently the, you know, the idea is that everyone should be treated equally. Yeah. It is extremely difficult to treat everyone equally if parts of society, characteristics, protect the characteristics again con- consistently identified as being different mm. in the name of treating them equally it's like complete it's completely backwards i had a different experience to you when i was growing up so or a different environment i grew up in south wales in the valleys yeah there was no one of a different skin color no. until i was a teenager no one was a different skin color everyone was white almost everyone was welsh you know um the only thing we really knew he didn't like was English people. Like literally, <laughs> I, I know I know it's a joke and stuff, but we literally didn't like English people, and um, to this day, still, it's still oh, a grudge they invaded our lands. But we didn't dislike people with different skin color. Yeah, he wasn't like that. Yeah, um, the point I'm making is that yeah, we grew up all white, but we we were we weren't brought up to hate. Black people, for example, or yep. people with a different skin color. What we didn't like, and this is common across the board, what we did, what we didn't like, and were fearful of, instinctively, because that was our tribe, that was a community, is things that are different to us, yeah. and we didn't understand. Yeah, and we only didn't like it until we did understand who or what it was that could be a threat. You know, it's this is the whole reason we. Are, Oh, it's the whole reason we have borders, right? It's the whole reason tribes and communities are tribes and communities because they, they're their own. They know each other, they understand each other. And to get into that tribe and community, it's, it's made difficult because they don't want to bring in a bad apple. 
Yeah, like, of course. This is got nothing to do with skin colour, by the way. But um, the well, same with when you meet hats. You're like, just, you know, you think you're probably not going to get on, and then it turns out you do get on because right. you don't know. You don't know they've got different. They might have a different <laughs> like, like the Marines or whatever. You know, you're like, oh, you, you the Marines will think things about Power Reg. Power Reg will think things about Marines. But then when you actually start talking to each other, you normally get on. It's just a bloke who... Just, oh, human beings, mate. Yeah, a bloke just decided to go to the left instead of right in the careers office or whatever. But it's the same. I think most people don't... I don't think... I, I genuinely don't think most people care about um, most the vast majority. That's what majority report. I'm kind of saying, this is, what the, uh, this is what I think the majority of people think. It's like, I, I really don't... I, I really don't believe that... Um, the majority of people are racist. I the, don't believe it. I, I agree. This this is the sad thing. Mm. That's what's <coughs> painted out to be the case. Most people don't care. Most people, most people will judge your merit. Yeah. There, I think you know. There's definitely been significant periods of history and recent history where there have been more. There are more people in the population, pick a country, who dislike other parts of the population simply because of skin color. Just as one example, just other parts of the population significantly dislike other people simply because of their, of their religion. Yep. There's other parts of the population significantly dislike other parts of the population simply because they come from a certain place. Yeah. Wales hate in England, for example. Sunderland hate in Newcastle, for example. Yep. It, this is a thing. This is, you know, this is a, it's all a, this is all a product of, you know, evolutionary biology and survival of the fittest. And, yeah, of course, yeah. and, and that, that's what it's all about. You can't, you can't get away from it. But I do think on the like on, on the racism front, it's significantly declining. Hmm. Like it is not a major issue. Don't get me wrong; it is a major issue if someone if, if an individual experiences racism yeah. uh, uh, um, in whatever situation. But uh, but how rare is it these days, really? And and it's even hard to judge. It's actually diff- difficult to judge that because the lines of what is and isn't racist has been so blurred, yeah, be- become it. so blurred. If you say anything bad about anyone and they're perceived as a protected characteristic, whether it's race or whether it's yeah. X, Y, Z, another thing, your negative commentary on that thing or observation is immediately tied to decided that you're saying that because of this protected characteristic. Yeah. No, I'm probably saying that because of an action they did yeah. or took or didn't take. You know? I say the word the racist has just been devalued. I mean, I've even like almost joked about it in the in, in majority report about who gets called a Nazi. And I think the last the last line in it is like Hitler Hitler would be spinning in his grave. It's like the, the, the little joke sort of comment at the end of it. Because you know, Nazis used to be you know, someone getting called a Nazi is pretty outrageous. It's pretty <laughs> outrageous to say someone's a Nazi. You know, based on so you say something they said about someone uh, because of they don't like them. Someone's going to assume that they don't like them because uh, you know they're Jewish or because they're they're not white. So it's got nothing to do with that. Maybe that person's just a bit of a bellend. But now you've labelled him a Nazi. It's like so now really when someone gets labelled a Nazi, it's on the new like Nigel Farage is a Nazi, Trump's a Nazi, everyone's everyone's a Nazi. It's just like you pay lip service to it, don't you? Yeah, you just get you just let the actual like, Nazis, yeah. the actual Nazis, get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Because <laughs> they still exist. Yeah, there's probably, not yeah. very, very many of them, but they still exist. Other, yeah. There's probably a few, uh, yeah. made quite a few little jokes about, you know, people wearing jack boots and wearing swastikas and it's like, they're just, they're just not there. They're yeah. just not there. There's the, you know, there's a few of them hiding away in a basement somewhere. But yeah, I just think, you know, you can't, if, you just can't call everyone you don't like, you know, far right or far left or Nazi or, you know, phobic, transphobic. It's just crazy. On the subject of equality and protected characteristics and, and things of such like, um, uh, yeah, a question from Coke. So what's your thoughts on females in the military, females in the front line, females in SF? And specifically, we've got first, we've got a first female platoon commander in Power Edge. Um, I think there's three now. Oh, yeah. not? I think there's three. Yeah. I knew there's one. I th- I've, I, do you know Paul Gadonis? No. No. X two and six six. Oh yeah, I do yeah. Because I spoke to you. Yeah, I spoke. Uh, well, I've just free text. Yes. Oh, he messaged you. Yeah, yeah. So Paul, Paul was Godonis, saying. Yeah, after, I think Paul messaged you off the back of a previous podcast, um, and he was saying that he thinks there's three in oh. Reg now. But so the, all arms in. They haven't gone through depot. Oh, yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Well, I suppose no officers, no officers go through depot, do they? No, but the but I, the the reason I point that out is because for me, the the big my the big milestone for females in the military, females in elite units, females in SF. Yeah. We're, we're power edge is concerned. We're not SF. We're power edge is concerned. The big milestone will be a female yeah. who joins up as a private and goes through power edge depot like everyone else does yeah. and passes that way. Because that will be a, a pretty unbelievable accomplishment. I think it'll be a credible accomplishment. I think that is the bar. Yeah. That is the bar. I just think the admin behind it would just be it just the uh, what's the what's the phrase? Juice would we have to squeeze, is that the right phrase? It would. She wouldn't have the same experience as the blokes do, right? And you could argue maybe it'd be easier for her, maybe harder for her. But you could make it as near as damn it. Yeah. If she goes through the entire process, mate, that eight months of just grim, grim, grim being in power edge. Eight months. Eight well, months. it is eight months, isn't it? Eight months, I'm not sure, mate. It's grim. Six, six, six and then onto the P company, B, uh, then onto P yeah. company, oh, yeah. then onto uh, the um, final X and life firing, and then the battalion. That there, I'd be like, okay. Oh, yeah, if you can do okay. it. Okay. You can do it. But the only drama is, because I've, I've worked Troy Service and I've worked with men and women, It can it's just that, that it's the admin of it. And you'll think if you if you, if you're going to push to get women in, there's women that can do it. And I've and this stuff, other this is other things I've you know I've written about pretty much all these sort of contentious subjects. Is of course there are women that can do. There's women that could knock you out. There's women that can knock me out. <coughs> there's women that can lift heavier things than us, run faster than us. I'm all over that. Great, but there's not. As a general rule, men are faster, stronger, fitter than women. As a general rule. And if you're going to have just like recruiting campaigns, when they started trying to recruit people from like uh, the, the advert where <coughs> someone stops and prays, I think, they're, I think they're trying to recruit Muslims in. And then they've got other adverts where there's like, they're try, obviously trying to inc- recruit people, um, ethnic minority. But you just think, just spend your money trying to recruit the people who are most likely to, to come through. Just invest in them get, and get them through, get just, just for the numbers. And so if other people want to come in, they'll come in. You know, but there's no point targeting or, tr- or putting loads of extra effort in just to hit a quota. I think that could be the. And the problem with if women started to, there wouldn't be that many women trying to join depot. Let's we'll say you had two and you have a platoon, and there's 50, 48 blokes, <coughs> two women, and two women are going to have to be separated. They're going to have to have their own room. They're going to have to have their own showers and ablutions and toilets, no doubt. You know, it will separate times. I, I, I was on a course that was being run in Norway a few years ago, a um, survival course, and there was two, I think there was two women on it. And because of the way the accommodation block was laid out, they had half of the accommodation block to themselves. So they, could, so they got separated ablutions and showers and toilets. And you had, like, I can't remember how many blokes, about 60 blokes in one half of the accommodation and two women in the other. It's like, it's just a waste, you know, it's a lot of money. With the heat in because it was in a cold country, it's just and they had their, you know, they had to have their own showers and all that. It's just little things like that become a pain in the ass, and it's a distraction. You know, the blokes are all, they're all, they're all, it's always going to happen. The blokes are, are going to yeah, fire into the blokes, yeah, the blokes are going to fire yeah, into that. But on that, the only thing with that is, is that that is because that's a that's <coughs> a facility training facility that is trying that is being geared up for men only, is trying to accommodate women. I think going forward, more training, more facilities, training or just camps or whatever, will be geared up to to aim off for this. More females well, becoming like single living accommodation and stuff for recruits. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Could be, could but the, but the reality is that I I I, I completely I, I agree with you. Like, don't don't pitch money at trying to specifically get. Basically, don't don't pitch money at trying to generate unnatural diversity within the unit. Yeah. But I also don't think target those who are most likely to join up. I think, I think, target everyone. If you're going to target anyone, target those who are most likely to pass. Mm. Um, but the main thing you should do is not try not to have anything in your recruiting system and processes that would unnecessarily discriminate against X, Y, or Z. You know, you don't want to, you, you want to, you want to, uh, like if a woman wants to sign up for Power Edge mm. at the recruiting office, you want her to have the same ability to do that as a bloke. Yeah, 
there shouldn't be any any bar. She shouldn't have any barriers that a bloke wouldn't have. Yeah. Same as black person, white person. Same as Muslim, Christian. Same as gay, not gay. Yeah. You know, same as. I was going to say transgender then, but I need to think that one through. I need to think that one through. <laughs> yeah. Um. That's yeah. So I think. Like, you, you, but there also has to be acknowledgement that. It's going to be costly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think if they do exactly the same, I don't care, mate. I'm the same as you. I don't care whether they're gay, straight, black, white, male, female. If they're all doing exactly the same thing. Do a job. Yes, as long as you can do it. And it's carrying the same weight, you know, doing the fitness standards to the same standard. Like when I, a long time ago, I did my PTI course, and like for men to pass to get a grade C, I think it was, you had to do 10 chin ups. But for girls, it was two. It's like, so there's, you know, just sort of people are, uh, people acknowledge that there's a physical difference. And I think when it comes to frontline fighting, this is why I look at things like, right? I'm, I'm a bit, I, I always have to exaggerate everything to get it into my brain. If there was a thousand men versus a thousand women to fight to the death, not many people would vote or bet that the women would win. And loads of blokes would die. Loads of, loads of women would kill loads of blokes. But, at the end of it, I think pretty much every time there'd be some men left and all the women would be dead. Yeah, but the, the the conclusion to draw from that is don't lower the current standards. Yeah. Like the you know, so, the, the, the 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 fitness standards and the physical tests and the the amount and weight and nature of the kit and equipment that we carry uh, in training, on selection, power edge selection, on SF selection, on on any unit in the military, frontline unit, that is not decided because we're men, mm. because it's males. That is decided because that is what is required okay. to be a, a capable fighting force and whatever you're doing. Obviously, the 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 the, the numbers and the values vary unit to unit and yep. mission mission operation operation, but that has nothing to do with gender or sex, no. and so. Lowering those standards is bad yeah. because then you lower you, you you lower the you lower the capability of that unit whoever's being whoever's having to accommodate the lower standards to get into that unit. Yeah, they're not as good as they would be otherwise. Yeah. Um, does that mean it's it's does that mean it's uh, unfair for women? No. Does it mean it's unlikely as many women are going to get into that unit as men? Yes. Is it unfair? No. Because it, I would say it, was, it would be unfair if those things were being decided because just men. Mm. And those things were being decided because we don't want women in. Those things yeah. have been decided because of fucking the laws of war yeah. and battle. Yeah. And, this and is how much uh, stuff weighs. You yeah, need to exactly. get a shift with it. Yeah. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think anyone, anyone who's sensible has got an issue. Like, like you said, that, uh, that woman who become a platoon commander, maybe, maybe it's three now in Power Edge. It was just, it was a matter of time, you know, because it happened to the Marines a long time ago. And obviously we, we used to take the piss. I certainly did take the piss out of the Marines. At, um, you know, women had passed their course. And that oh, it was joyous. I remember it was yeah. joyous when Blokes they had phoning them up when they phoned up yeah. the guard rooms and yeah. saying, oh, can there's a chance of my missus, <laughs> my missus put a bit of weight on over Christmas. Is there any chance I can send her down to you to do your course? Uh, but yeah, and that, you know, it's just, oh, oh, as you say, it's just a matter of time, you know, they'll get, they'll get, they'll get their own back because it's a matter of time. And I think most blokes, when they heard that a woman had passed P company, was just like, good, that's good skills. Good, the good. only people, just on your point, you, know, you were saying we don't care. Like, it just it doesn't care what, what, what you look like, where you're from, what fucking, what your first language is, what your religion is. It literally doesn't matter. Um, and the only, the only time I, the only times I ever remember despising people and really hating people those people were because they were not able to do their job mm. they were not up to the task generally it was because fitness fitness was an issue mm. and most of the time those people i despised they weren't pyro edge they were from other they were attached arms normally and this is on operations um and um and it was more noticeable when those I would have thought have struggled like a female didn't. Mm. I admired them more mm. than 
you are a bloke in the platoon because they were a female attached to a reg battalion yeah. in, for example, Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever. And they were cutting the fucking mustard. Yeah. Go, because that's a hard, it's a hard world to live in when you're a, when you're one thing, one type of thing in a group of another type of thing. Yeah. If you're a ginger, if you're a ginger bloke in a group of blonde dudes, if you're a Welsh guy in a company of English guys, if you're a female in a unit of men, you know, if you're a, if you are a non power edge soldier, in a power reg battalion. Yeah. You know? Vice versa. If you're a power reg soldier, a power, a power reg bloke, a reg bloke, a Tom, in a unit of non ferocious, yeah. in some non reg unit, hard. You know? It's like, and if you can cut the mustard and those extreme pressure, then you've got the utmost admiration. But going back to the point, the only people I ever despised were because of their, they, their, their merits were not up to the task. They weren't able to do what we needed to do, and they were, they were a detriment to the unit. Yeah, there's a big thing in Power Edge. I think fitness, you know, because you can get away with quite a lot in Power Edge, you know, if, but if you're super fit, like the super fit guys pretty much get left alone because they're super fit. And, it, you know, they, they might be slacking a little bit in common sense or the, the, the soldiering skills, but or they might not be on a map read. Yeah, but they go and beat PTIs, like, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it, mate. Yeah, that's it. But they'll get, a, they'll get, you know, they get, a, they kind of get a buy. But I just think if, um, not practically, if this is a put question I put to, I had a Canadian boss once. He, he'd been a lieutenant colonel in a Canadian army, and then he was a full time reserve. I, I worked in Warminster for a year in a training and development team now, army of course. And uh, he was saying to me about you know women can do everything men can do and all this. And I was like, so I said, look, there's some am- amazing women out there, but you know, generally, I don't, okay. be- I don't believe you that you believe that. <laughs> and he's like, ah, well, I do. I'm like, okay. And I was like, I said, well, I'll put this to you. I said, if if you had a section of blokes pinned down, running out of ammo, right, and you needed to get that ammo to them real quick, you had a section of eight people, four blokes, four women, and you needed to get that heavy load of ammo up and over a hill, potentially running into an enemy fire to resupply that section, or they're all going to die. If you had to pick four people to take that ammo, you pick the four blokes. What did he say? He said, no, I fucking wouldn't. I said, I, said I, I don't believe you. I said, I think you would. Because generally, men can carry more weight and move faster with that weight over ground. I said, I just, I, I just don't believe you. He said, I wouldn't. And then he, he actually used the diggers. I remember he used the, the cutlery. I don't remember the word now. On the table to say, this is a quality line. And, it, and then he had like the tip of a, of, of a knife. And said, and this is this is where we need, to, this is a quality line. And this is like what you're talking about, the, like the line of excellence. He's there, and he just kind of drew a line in the middle and said, "This is where, this is where they need to be." This is the problem. Is this is again going back to the problem of the, the, the way these um, issues or topics have been painted as being taboo to discuss. He can't bring himself to have a subject, an, an objective reasoning about that, right? Because right, yeah. you can flip it round. You could ask him, "Okay, you've got um, you, you know, you've got a, you know, you got a, a bunch of children who are in need." Like, they literally are in tatters. They have been bruised, battered, yep. abused. Yeah, and you've got <laughs> a you team did. of eight. <laughs> yeah, you've got, you got you and fucking well, bad example. You've got, you know, you got, you got four men and you've got four women. Yeah. Who are you most likely to choose? I know I'm choosing yeah. the women. Exactly, yeah. Because they're better at that than men. The problem is with it. The problem is... With the argument about with the argument about the physical capability side mm. is because it's connected to survival. Yeah. It's like men are more likely to be able to survive in a physical confrontation. Men are more likely to be able to kill in a physical confrontation. Most men are more likely to be able to kill most women in a physical confrontation. Yeah. It's like it's a life and death thing, which is why it's a it's such a difficult topic for people like that Canadian yeah. to address objectively because you have to acknowledge that generally speaking, women are worse at surviving those situations than men. Men are better at enacting violence and surviving violence than women. Yeah, generally, yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. 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 Does it mean men are better than women? Or No, it doesn't. Does it mean women... Does, does women being great with people and kids and fucking raising children are better than men? No. However, however, every single individual on this earth comes from women. 
It's like Jesus Christ. I, I, when I think about that line, I think every single person on this earth get, literally came from a woman. Yeah, blows my mind. I think Tyson Fury is what I said. But uh, you, you have to be able to discuss these things objectively. If you can't, it's absolute nonsense, and you you you're fighting a pointless battle. Really, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, what are you looking at now in your book for? I'm just looking for this because uh, <laughs> we were just talking about this is something we talked about a minute ago. I'm looking for something I wrote about gingers. I was telling you about yesterday. But I'll find it. While you're looking through, got a couple of oh, you got one. no, you know, got a couple of questions here that we haven't gone through from uh, from, from Coke. So, um, oh, apparently Ben Garwood is referenced on a podcast that he was uh, physically he experienced physical bullying in depot. An oh, example yeah. of a person in authority abusing their power. Um, what if the person who gets beaten reports it to officers? Would the system back them or say you deserved it? That is, in my experience, that is entirely dependent enough. Normally, the system would back them. I, I, I experienced this. So, um, yeah. uh, when I won't go into the details, there was an individual who fucked up and this individual who fucked up royally was given the option of, see, see, the thing is here, you have to punish these people. Yeah. Right. Or you have to do some, you have to teach them the area of their ways. Right. So this individual who fucked up bad. Yeah, and it was in the UK. It was an operation back here in the UK. Uh, he was given the option: okay, we can do this by the book, like through the what was known as the Agai process, yep. the disciplinary process, or we can play big boys' rules. Yeah, and you're going to get taken downstairs. You're going to get hit, and it wasn't a battering. You're yep. literally going to get not like punched once. You're going to get slapped as a punishment. Yeah, and we gave this individual the choice: which would you like? And he chose sensibly. Getting the punch, yep. getting the punch, yeah, by by his uh, his commander of that unit meant that the lesson was taught. It was big boys' rules, and he didn't have a disciplinary official disciplinary thing on his military record. Yeah, he chose the punch, yeah, took the work. punch immediately after, went and fucking put a complaint in. No. Yeah, he went. To the, he went to the brigade padre, mate. Yeah. Big little shit. Anyway, That's he got outrageous. booted out for drugs in the end. It turns out he was a yeah, Shit. he was one of those. So um, we had a bloke. Yeah, when the the big head padre. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's bad. That's Fucking hell, man. Because I know that, oh, that used to be quite common. Now, I've heard of RSMs. I think they are. I think it was RSM in free power when I was a young Tom there. They used to do that. Say that to the bloke. Do you want my punishment or the punishment? And the bloke should just be like, "Your punishment, sir." And he just go wham on punch. I think he used to give him like a, a body shot. Yeah. <sighs> just like, done. Then that's it. Right. You, know, you took your punishment. Well done. Get out. Well, we had a bloke in depot who joined up with me. I don't want to say his name. You might not know him. He's too, he went to two par, but he um, he had his wings already. So he'd done. He'd been in the TA, and one of our four screws absolutely took a massive dislike to him immediately because he had his wings up. And he even went up to our platoon sergeant and said, "I said, is it all right if I take? Uh, do I have to wear my wings?" And he said, "Fucking right, you do. You've earned them. You know, you wear them with pride." And he's like, I, I just don't want to draw attention to myself. And he's like, oh, you've earned them wings, do you? were wearing them. So he's like cutting about with his like tabs or whatever. We had yellow or red tabs on our pellets and that's to show we were crows and with green back, green back in on our cap badge. And he used to get, mate, he used to get dug quite a lot, especially by one, one particular full screw. He's like, you eyeballing me? He'd be like, they weren't even looking at him. He'd be, he'd be, you could just see, you'd be looking. He'd be not, he weren't even looking at him. And he just gets so angry. I think he was genuinely angry. Genuinely, he, I think he really thought he was giving him dirty looks. He's just like, and he's just, and he's terrifying. Like, he's just, just run up. He just like, goes for the ranks. Blokes would be stood there like that. So he just push him out of the way. Whammo. He always punched him in like the solar plexus of the gut. He'd be like, oh, God, stand up. And he just hated him. You fucking stab. You know, stupid TA bastard as it was back then. But he, I mean, he, 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 went, he, he got through it. I said, yeah, if ever I talk to him, like, that will come up. Yeah. I'll say, shit, man, you got some grief. Oh, my God. He got some grief. And it was out of turn, really, but I think the bloke genuinely hated people from the TA. And he just couldn't get his head around it. But, you know, he's doing the right thing. Because he could have, cause he could have backdoored it. You know, a lot of people did. Well, I say backdoored it. He could have gone you know, the other way where they just come and get an attachment and then stay on and extend. But, yeah, he went, he went through day one. From day one, yeah, he used to get a lot of punch. He used to get punched quite a lot. That's bullying, really. Mm. <laughs> I was like, that's bullying. There's really. a place, isn't there? There's a place. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, people get carried away and it goes too far. 
by doing it incorrect, incorrectly, just, just, just unnecessary, unnecessary use of violent force. It's like fuck's sake, man. One of my first days in depot, I see a lad get kicked in the face while he's doing push-ups. Actually, that was quite shocking. So what got, by a what? screw? Yeah. No. Yeah. And as I remember it, I can't imagine. I can't. The more I think about it, I think surely he would have dropped. Like he was like doing push-up line, and I like just ran along, and kicked him in the face. The boots on. But I can't remember what, I don't know whether I just looked away at that point. But I just, I don't remember him like dropping or anything or anything happening afterwards. But it definitely happened. But I just can't remember what happened after. I just remember him bloke getting kicked. And I remember his face going like that, really like whipping up to the side. And the bloke was screaming at me. I, I got, I got, I got, uh, I got toe pegged in the face in Depo. And it was, um, we'd just done bayonet training. Oh, no, no. Or was it the start of bayonet training? He's either starting to finish a Benedict training because they're both rations anyway before Benedict training. And it was in Catrick and we did we played this game which they I think they invented on the spot. It was called King of the Pit. And it was like this pit which was just, it was muddy, it was full of water. Um, and a whole platoon had to get in there. So at that time there was probably around I don't know 30 of us at that time 30 or 40 of us we have been whittled down to is quite I don't know what point that was. Anyway, the aim of the game was stay in the pit and you could, and, and it was just the Joes, yeah. as in the recruits, and you had to evict other people from the pit by any means necessary. Any means necessary. It was just a fucking scrap. Mate. Yeah. And I ended up rolling with one guy into the, I was on the floor. <laughs> there you go, I should have jiu jitsu. Okay. On the floor. Okay. <laughs> I got onto all fours to get up and I got a, Fucking boot to the face by another Joe. Straight to the face. I put my teeth One of your own mates as well, basically. I don't know. I can't remember what it was. I can't remember what it was. Fucking horrendous, mate. Fucking horrendous. Yeah, you did mental shit in Depot. Mental. Just climbing over each other, just not to be mental. last. We had a bloke stabbed mental. in the back. Well, it depends the on the platoon you're in. It depends on the staff, doesn't it? But Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't suppose there's that much difference, really. There was one screw there. It was dropping me all the time. It was dropping, dropping you? Oh, dropping me oh, all really? the time, mate. All the time. What was his beef with you? Um... I was weak, mate. I was not a I was not a strong minded individual. How I got through that I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm surprises me to this day. Probably fitness <laughs> mainly carried me through it. You know. I'm not a complete buffoon. I was able to take on the information. But I wasn't confident. I did not like for confrontation, did not like violent confrontation, it was happening all the time. Yeah. And when I would get flustered or pressured, um I would I would mess up sometimes. Oh yeah very different than what I became but that's what I was at the time and so the the threshold at which he would hit me just got lower and lower <laughs> as he got more frustrated I mean but did that in millions of times but enough that I remember it thinking fuck like, that was too much because like, yeah. it it didn't improve me I was just sort of getting more and more a shell inside myself yeah. you know, I was getting less confident with it because I was so afraid of fucking up it was like that anxiety like oh, God, you're overthinking everything, and then yeah. you know what I mean. It was like the, it was like the the wrong punishment for me. <laughs> did you see that like afterwards? Did you? did you see him in battalion? Uh no, he was a different battalion, but he had an unnecessary, he had an unfortunate um, uh, dog leg in his career. Oh, right. yeah, I tell you about after. You know, unfortunately, you think, oh, oh yeah. I'm kind of glad about that. Yeah, really apparently he was an all right bloke. Apparently he was an all right bloke. Um, because when I mentioned this to people after from the battalion he was in, he's a sound block. I was like, he fucking wasn't in depot. Mm-hmm. wasn't in depot. But you get it, don't you? People turn. Yeah, some people can't people handle turn. it. Or, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I didn't yeah. really see. We, we were quite lucky. I went to A Company and we didn't, we didn't really get A Company 3 power. Yeah. 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 We went to 3 power, yeah. We just had to get naked in the in the, in the Yeah, in the that was kind of. And get, yeah, that was, that was our kind of initiation. We had to buy a, buy a crate of beer, which is a massive amount of money, and then uh, go downtown and then get naked in the fives. And then, you know, that was our initiation but you know some of the other blokes had to you know, do chippy runs and but no no one from my platoon as far as I'm aware got like, bullied there was loads of horror stories like you say I mean I was on the like my room in A Company was the nearest one to like for anyone anyone coming back off the piss pretty much had to walk past my window so people were throwing stones at the window and going, yeah, Crow, get up, Crow, and all this. And I was just like, I was thinking, that. But they, did, they probably didn't even know it was my room. They're just shouting up to me. Right? <laughs> but yeah, I was just like, like in my bench, oh, shit, they come here, they come. I thought, it's going to happen. But we, we were quite, it was 
we're quite lucky we're all quite civilised really not to go and get naked in them and um, yeah I've written about that because it was just mental that f- the fives was absolutely mental I never experienced it that's fucking mental mate in what way in there, it was just abs- I'll explain what the fives was for the uninitiated <laughs> fives is airborne in in order shot as a pub which um, it's quite a minimalist place really like a, um, <laughs> yeah there was loads of airborne pictures and that everywhere in the bar the people just people there it, I walked in there the first time, and it was just it was carnage. There's a people like body surfing over the over the top, people fighting, people just pissing wherever they're standing. No one ever took their bottle or glass back to the bar; they just smashed it on the floor. There was people getting naked all over the place. It was absolutely mental. And I went in there with this bloke I joined up with called John. He was like twenty mid twenties. Uh, John Austin. He ended up getting really badly injured really early on in, in battalion. But he loved it. He was like, he was, he was like, oh yeah, this place is awesome. But he was, he was older, you know. He thought he'd been around a bit. He'd been a fisherman down in uh, Cornwall. Oh for God, yeah, he no, was like, he it. mad for it. And um, but we knew we'd been told you'll be getting fucking naked later. Because I got told we were in the block beforehand, and someone's like, one of one of the boats says to me, um, "You got a girlfriend?" I was like, uh, yeah. I said, "Did I have a girlfriend?" Yeah, I think yeah, I did. I said, "Yes, yes, Corporal." And he's like, oh, right. and he said, uh, "You got a big cock, have you?" <laughs> And I was like, uh, uh, what? He goes, uh, you got a big cock. Let's have a look. Get it, get it, get it out. And it's like, everyone's just sat there in the semicircle. And I was thinking, this is fucking weird. Bearing in mind, right, I'd walked in there. I swear, mate, it was like the pad room. It was just a, a, a black bin full of ice and water. You're not doing beer. three powers repetition any good, you <laughs> Honestly, I walked in there, right? And as I walked in, there's one half of this, it's like two four-man rooms in the old spider, spider blocks. One side was this bloke called Clyde or Clive. No, I never really knew what his name was. Just a big old sweat Tom with a big tash, big bloke, big hairy bloke. And on the other half was just the pads lockers. And I walked in there, and on the right hand side, all the blokes sat around this bucket of ice and drinking beer. And then as I looked to the left, and Clyde, he's, 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 he's quite quiet, but he was just intimidating, big old boy. He was, he was sat down. In a mini dress, which I'd seen hanging up on his on his wall previously, I didn't know it was for him. It was this like gold, silvery, sparkly thing, mini dress with a blonde wig on and some red, bright red lipstick. But he had a big, like handlebar tash in that. And I was just like, saw him, and I was like, oh, what the fuck? And I'd heard we were getting told that you know you get wound up in depot you know, when you get when you get the battalion, you know, the blokes you, know, you get sorted out as some blokes uh, sort you out and they'll break you in and I was thinking oh no and I was thinking I'm going to get fucking bummed by him and I'm not going to be able to do anything about it because he's massive and I was like oh no fucking hell anyway sat down to this bloke's like you know should I just cock then and I was, I was like I could still these blokes sat there just drinking I don't know whether they expected me to do it or what but you know what no one gives no one, they don't give anything away do they they all just sat there like and I was just I, was just, oh, I thought I was doing that later in, in fives and he went that's right you fucking are and I thought, have I just got away with that or have I just set myself up? <laughs> I got into fives and they were like, get up. Some blokes were, this bloke weren't even there by then. Other blokes just, get up there, Joe, get up there and get naked. So I started, I got up, me and John got up. John was just straight off of his clothes. Yeah, he loved it. He didn't give a shit. I was like, and I thought, no, I, never, you know, I thought they want a show sort of thing. And I started like trying to, obviously I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't do it now, I couldn't do it then, trying to lure a sexy sort of dance. And people were just getting angry with me. Get him off. Just get fucking naked, you crow and all this. And there's women stood there. And I thought the women would be like, oh my God, there's a bloke getting naked. They didn't give a shit. The women were just like, come in, have a have a look. And then I started like, I'm doing my bed and people were just like ripping my trousers down. And then someone, I was just stood there dancing naked for a bit. And then someone grabbed my trousers by the, around my ankle, just yanked me off this little stage we were on, like a little, little ele- elevated sort of step. And I landed and, like, in the crowd, luckily landed on my feet. And people were throwing pints on me. Someone was pissing on me. Someone stick, stuck a fag out on me. It was absolutely mental, mate. That's just what I, that was my first time in there. And then, like, probably half an hour later, the bloke who'd said to me, right, you're getting naked, you know, yes, you are getting naked, he came in. He said, get up there. I said, I've just been up there. He said, he didn't give a shit. He said, get up there. <laughs> Why do you think that that, that kind of um, behaviour ex- existed and exists? I don't know. I suppose it's just for amusement, isn't it? Just to bring people I down. I don't know. I think it's deeper than that. Well, you think it's like homo... Well, it's, we, we, like, it's not... Only three para. Oh, it's yeah. not only reg. Oh, yeah. It's other units, right? But to varying degrees. Mm. 
okay, of extremity. And what I think it is, is because I've thought about this many, 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 many times. And what I think it is, it is that it is a spillover from as on a daily basis as part of the culture, pushing the limits mm. of what we were able to do. Yeah. Physically, mentally, as a fighting force. And the attitude that that brings with it. Driving yourself to to the extreme. Yeah. To do extreme things, exhibit extreme behavior, unusually extreme behavior in order to achieve the aim when it's required. Be that extreme violence, mm. be that extreme, um, be that extreme uh, resilience, um, be that extreme exhibitions of physical capability short and sharp or fast and long i remember watching i remember i remember one of the things that will will stick with me forever afghanistan it was 2008 and um i'm digressing slightly we've only got a few minutes left by the way but um afghanistan 2008 and you know what a two miler is right yeah oh, i can't believe you just asked you that fucking of course you know what a two miler is two miler for the uninitiated is a is like one of the bog standard physical like uh, tests we'll do on a regular basis and it is you know you're gonna you're gonna go two miles as fast as you can carry in at minimum 35 pound burger on your back if not heavier sometimes you'll do it a weapon and webbing and all this right but it's two miles essentially and it is yeah you know, it's as hard as you want to make it the, the, the minimum time is the maximum time is 80 minutes any less than that's good you know you can bang it out uh, the quickest you can bang it out 12 30 minutes the, at, at the upper the upper you know the really fit guys will bang out 12 30 minutes when we were in Afghanistan in 2008 and we were doing um, high value target missions out there for that tour really fucking fun time it was um, long story short we helied in my I was snip- snipers at the time my mm-hmm. team went went through on high ground to overwatch uh, the the company moving into a village quick to yep. capture a high value target and get out they landed in the wrong place Got dropped off the wrong place. I can't, I don't know why, what happened. They were two miles out from the village. So they did a two miler. This is Afghanistan. It was the summer. It was like 50. Well, it's, it's one of those, it's just one of those stories. Yeah. There's a million stories that people have. They never tell them. And I wasn't in that platoon. I was watching these fuckers, mate. And they had two miles to go and they started fucking sprinting. And they, I say sprinting. They got to this village, uh, they got this village in a two-miler strip. It was all this kit. This is more than 35 pounds, as you know. This is frontline scales and more. All the water, all the ammo in the company carry there. Crazy weights they had. I could not believe they did it. I was like, fuck. You know, that, no. And you've got different people carrying different weights. Yeah, they got there and there was a comms issue. And they needed to, They were trying to identify the individual that they were trying to get. They couldn't find him. There was a mix-up with the incel back in Kandahar. They ended up tabbing out. So they leave the village like, fuck, because they didn't want to get the wrong guy. So they leave the village to go back to the helis, two miles. Get back to the village. Incel, comms re-established, go, yeah, that is the guy. No. Another two miler in. They did back-to-back two milers. Shit. In Afghanistan, mate, with like two or three times the amount of weight they were able to do that in the UK. And, it, and I remember thinking, holy fuck. They got in, they were fucked. If you asked them to do that in the UK with all that kit, they would be hard pressed to do that mm. with all that kit because the the urgency isn't there. Mm. That need for the resilience isn't there. It was a, it was a, a, another example of this. It was a guy I had in my platoon. So I, I told you I had one platoon when I was a platoon sergeant. Mm. Three, and there was a guy in that platoon with, with me for a while, and he came from the G4 chain. So he was you know he was coming back in. He was trying to get him up to fitness. He couldn't pass a two miler, right? Basic couldn't pass a two miler. So so at the time we started doing this three mile the company me. A guy called Luke and another guy called Grosey. We started, we introduced three miler. So we wouldn't do two milers on a Tuesday. We did three milers on the Tuesday. This guy could do two miles in the two miler time. He could do three miles, right? Three miler. He'd do the two miles at three miler in under the two miler time. But if I said to do the two miler, he'd fail it yep. all in his head. Yep. It's because uh, uh, c- the kind of the flip side to that Afghanistan situation. So going back to my point on that extreme behavior on the pissing town in the block i think it's a spillover from 
constantly pushing ourselves to the limits of our ability physically and mentally, mm. right? You're pushing the envelope. And I think that spills over into the social side of it, the barrack room side of it, in that you, it, 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 you exhibit extreme behavior. You push the extremities of what is socially acceptable to, to, to normalize it amongst you, amongst the group. Like everything else is normalized. Everything else extreme is normalized. Does yep. that make sense? I really think it's that. From the nakedness to all the other stories of the th- things that go on to all of the other million things that civilians will never know about. Mm. You know, um, I think that's what it is. It's, yeah. you, you just, you just push in the limits of your, of your, of your behavior, you know, and, and it varies from between, between unit to unit. Um, because of cultures, but, but in general, I think that's what it is. And it's across every unit, predominantly frontline units, infantry units. Yeah, where it's all blokes. Yeah. yeah. But the peak of it is reg battalions, I think. And you don't get it in PF, you don't get it in SF, which is interesting. Yeah. Not to the same level, anyway. Yeah, I suppose you've kind of proved yourself. I think a lot of it, with, especially with the new blokes, these initiations and that, it's just, it's just like a subservience thing, making, letting you know, hum- bit of humiliation. Just to let them know that mm. you know, you're not bossy, you're not the boss here, mate. Well, you'll do whatever we tell you to do. I think there's a bit of that. Yeah, definitely got. Must be a bit of that involved. But um, yeah, that's that's hardcore. That and then yeah, it's interesting hearing about blokes doing the two milers like that. Cause that would be hard if, uh, in that environment. Oh, mate, it was horrendous. Yeah. Well, I wasn't even on it. <laughs> yeah. It was horrendous, mate. Uh, right. Finishing off, Steve. We've got a few, we've got a bunch of questions from Coke. I want to get through if that's all right, and then we'll close it off. So, uh, um, I had a previous guest, Ben Griffin, actually mentioned him to you off air. Uh, ben Griffin, ex Power Reg, ex SAS. He claimed that the US tortured civilians and used his unit to deliver them, to, and used his unit to deliver the civilians for this. Did you witness Americans or other Allied forces abusing civilians? Um, if PF had witnessed that. What would the response have been? So, did you witness anything like that? No, no, I never seen anything, anything, anything like that. To be what fair. would the PF response have been if he did? Well, I suppose it depends on what sort of scale it's going on, really. There's a. I've I'm trying to think what I have seen. I've seen. I've seen. Like in Africa, I've seen people definitely overstepping a mark with like punishment to civilians, UN soldiers. Not British, <clears throat> other African soldiers, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, instead, and I just like well, and a, and a lot of people say let, 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 let the Africans deal with the Africans. And I said to a, I said to a bloke, what the, you know, why is he doing? A, a bloke, I, I saw a, a, a Nigerian bloke whipping kids with a, a stick, and they're basically on their foreheads. They woke me up and shouting. They're on their tiptoes with their hands behind their back and on on their foreheads like in an inverted V. You're just walking around whipping them on the backs and on the ass and the back of the legs. And uh, I said to one of the night, there's two Nigerians I'd got to know. I said to one of them, this is Sierra Leone. I said, what's, what's, what's going on here? And he said, they're rebels. They are rebels. I said, that's just look like kids to me. He said, they are rebels. I said, how do you know? And he went, all of them are rebels. I'm like this, he's like, he's like, he looked at me, he wasn't even was loopy. I was just like, well, they're always walking around whacking people with sticks anyway. So, I don't know what these kids have done. I don't, you know, it's just like, oh, I'll just leave them to it. Um, that's just that's just the way it works. You know, it's, that's a different culture. But yeah, yeah. As, as far as like any sort of criminal or anything going under uh, out, of, out of hand happening, nah, I've never seen anything like that. No, I saw, I saw it. I saw it once. Oh, yeah. So um, yeah, I saw it once, and it was uh, it was in Iraq, and there was a it was a TA guy, and he was part of our unit. And, um, he, he basically took it upon himself to start, um, unnecessary dishing out some physical punishment to, um, a prisoner that we had. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he was, he was immediately stopped by us because yeah. it was in the immediate vicinity of us. He was, he was violently stopped. And, um, he, he was bounced as in disciplinary procedure oh, yeah. for it. Yeah. 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 It was completely uncalled for. I don't know why he did it. Uh, okay. What was the, what's the lowest, uh, you've been mentally in the mil- in your military service and life, and how did you get through it? Um, lowest, it's been a few. It's been a few times. And I've gone. Through, I've gone through quite a lot of stuff with that. Um, no, no different to anyone else. But um, I'm just quite. I'm just been really open about it. 
but I think I was on the lowest. On the lowest was after, it was after, well after, or leaving brigade, not being away from all the blokes, and just being in another, you know, another away from your like your real close muckers. And I was, yeah, I went to, I went to get, um, I went to the med center to see if I could get some help, because I knew I, I wasn't right. I was really low, and um, yeah, I basically did a, I did a multiple choice test in a mental health hospital, and they just said, oh, you're all right, you haven't got, you haven't got PTSD." <laughs> This is about 2010 or 11. Again, there's something else I've, you know, I've written about this in quite a lot of detail, the, the okay. mental health stuff. And I was like, I remember the, the nurse said to me, well, according to this, uh, like a printout, she goes, you haven't got PTSD. I was like, what the fuck said anything about PTSD? I said, what are you talking about? She was like, well, this says you haven't, you yeah, know, you don't think you've got that. And I said, who said, no one said I did. And then she was just, and I basically got moved on. And then about five years later, I, I kind of found myself in a similar position. Went sick. I knew. I, I was. Just, I, I. I really, genuinely think I would. I would have. I would have murdered someone. Yeah, you know, I really do believe that. And it could have been anyone. It could have just been anyone in, in one place. You know, just someone not indicating or something stupid like that. It could have been anything. And that's why I went because I thought. You know, I upset my kids smashing something up in front of my kids. Lost my rag about something. Again, this is all stuff I've, I've written. That that book you've been asked too. There's quite a lot of mental health stuff in that. But um. Yeah, and then I, w- I went again. I was in a really, yeah, I was re- in a really low place. I just burst out, I burst out crying when I said it to the doctor. I need some help. Please help me. I said, please help me. And even even saying it, every time I say it, if I say it to people, it kind of brings it all back, and I kind of feel it makes me feel like I remember how sad I was. But yeah, I just started crying, and I was just like, Fuck. And I, was, I felt pathetic. But I was just like, you know, I just need, I got, I've got to get some help because I'm gonna fucking, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm definitely, I'm pretty sure I was gonna kill someone, anyone. I had an almost identical experience, not yeah. to the point I was going to kill someone. I wasn't feeling that, but the same thing. When I finally decided to go and go and get help, yeah, for hardest thing, I've, hardest thing I've ever done. But yeah. I, I, and I, I was, I, I sat in the car twenty minutes before, crying, literally uncontrollable. Well, before you went and asked before for it. I went in, yeah. I spent the whole morning sobbing <laughs> uncontrollably, literally yeah. uncontrollably, and then tried to sort myself out before I walked in, and um. And then I walked in, it was blatant, and I'd be fucking crying because I was just, my eyes just red, rubbing them, and yeah. you know, all, literally all morning since sort of 5, 6 a.m. And then walked in, and then um, I, I'm fighting back the tears, fighting them back. Like embarrassment, shame, yeah. and sadness at myself, the position yeah, I was in. That's it. Didn't yes. know what the fuck. And uh, I said, uh, I'd like to speak to someone, please. And um, the effort to get those words out was horrendous. I was hoping she would just say, Grab a seat. No, I saw you out in a minute. Yeah. Like she would see in my face. She didn't. She said, um, what's the problem? Oh, yeah. So you didn't know. And um, I didn't know what the problem was. I didn't have a clue. Yeah. I d- I, that was part of the problem. Yeah. I didn't I didn't know what was wrong. I, what the fuck? Yeah, and I fine, the, yeah. I, she burst into tears. Yeah. And she said, grab a seat. Yeah. I'll grab a seat. I was That's bringing it back for you now, isn't it? Yeah. So it's it's hideous. It like you, mate. Face, when yeah. you, you said, I, I hate thinking about it because I remember how sad I was yeah, yeah. and how low I was. And yeah. it's the most horrific thing. And whenever I hear about other people who have either like taken their own life mm. or been that close to it, it, it I, un- I understand. Yeah. And, uh, and the feeling of, that much despair is horrific. Yeah. I I don't, it's like indescribable. It's indes- yeah. as you know, it is indescribable. Nothing, there's no way I can describe it. There's no way I could replicate that pain for someone else. You literally have to go through it yourself before yeah. you realize how fucking dark it is, how yes. dark it is and debilitating it is. Yeah. That's horrendous. It's debilitating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was exhausted. I was just exhausted all the time, mate. But, you know, you know, I answered the, uh, what Coke's question was as well. It was like, I was so tired. I didn't even realise at the time. You know, I'm, all, I'm, I'm I'm much much better now. But I was just always thinking about someone coming, like someone coming in that door and, and kicking off with them. Think what well, they got a knife, what well, they got a bolt, what well, they say something to you, what well, they say something to me. What am I going to do? And it, it always, every single scenario ended up in one of us dead. Not me or you, one me or the person. Because I was just like, I'm gonna if they do that, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna attack. You know, if they're as if they're as determined as I am to win, you know, one of us is going to end up dead. But I'd be like, I'd be like just walking through the shops, especially when they're young kids, when I'm like holding my daughter's hand or something. Someone coming the other way. I'd, every everyone that's a credible sort of threat, you know, every kind of fighting age man really. I'd just be like thinking, what if he does it? What if this happens? Uh, it's really hard to describe to someone because a thousand scenarios would be racing through my brain, all ending with one of us dead. 
Mm. You know, I'm thinking that. What if he spits on my kid? It's so unlikely. What if he kicks her? What if he says, what if he tells her to fuck off? Like, who does that to a kid? Mm. Like, I couldn't stop it. it was, and it was all day, every day. Nightmare. That's what I don't like crowds now. So I'm just thinking, what if he kicks What if he kicks off? What if mm. he kicks off? What if he kicks off? I'm just thinking, fuck it now. Mm. Before I know it, I thought, you know, I've imagined fucking this bottling, stamping on and fucking stabbing 100 people. Or, you know, or, do- or that, all them doing that same thing to me. Mm. Just like, oh, it was fucking tiring. Uh, last question before we finish off. Uh, there's a thank you from Coke, by the way, for sharing your uh, mental health insight there. It'll help someone watching to do so the same, which could save their life. Um, last question. So there are a bunch in here, but we haven't got time to go through them all. So if a civilian in the UK had no survival or self-defence knowledge, where would you recommend they go to learn? Hmm. Self-defence. Survival knowledge is quite hard to come by because there's lots of schools out there that haven't really got anyone qualified to teach, to be fair. And they're teaching, a lot of people are teaching a lot of nonsense. There's a lot of it. Even in the military, you know, there's, there's only one place now, one, one school for survival. I teach everybody. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think if I've got any, I've got a mate, I've got a couple of mates who run survival schools. Uh, I've got one mate down in Cornwall, but. Again, I've never taught. I've never taught on their survival schools. I don't know, you know. I mean, Tom Blakey, you know Tom, don't you? Tom's got his own. He, he runs. I think he runs survival courses. I've not been on them. I guess Tom's doing a good job. Prepare Pathfinder. Um, martial arts wise, I, t- I think I'd, I'd send someone to um, self defence. Send someone to an MMA, to an MMA gym. I think it's the best. Get a bit. Of le- le- learn a little bit of everything. Even just the concepts, concepts of striking, concepts of takedowns, defence, and a few, a few basic submissions. You know, and you'd be. I think you'd be much, much better off, or much more likely to come out. But that's what I say to like, especially not the women's self-defence. All my classes, really. I just say, first and foremost, you know, what people should pick on someone else, and that's what we learn in Power Edge, right? It's yeah. like Power Edge. We've got a reputation already. People see Power Edge come or hear Power Edge is coming, they're like, oh fuck it, we got. They don't want, no one wants to fight Power Edge. And then it's like when the blokes get out on patrol, they dominate the ground. They 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 they're all full of confidence. They're like, good, you know they're cocky, they're cocksure. Um, people, you know, my my take, I, I hashtag it a lot. I pick on someone else. Do so you want to be like that? Do I pick on him? No. What about him? No. What about him? And then you think of it from a criminal's perspective. And I used to be a bit of a bastard myself. So I, you know, I'm not going to pick on you because you're when we met, I'm like fucking bigger than I thought. I'm not going to, you know, I might, I might pick on me, but I'm doing, I'm going to look for someone else. Look for the weak person, the worst person who looks lost and doesn't look like they can handle themselves. They're, they're the one who's going to get mugged, aren't they? Mm. Before me or you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not saying I can still get mugged, so can you? But you know, there's easier targets. And if you know a little bit of everything, self-defense wise, a lot of it's just concepts. You know, you're a lot better off than the next person, even if it's, even if that concept is to run away. Yeah, just fucking run mm. if you can. Run or not. Mm-hmm. Makes me mega. Um, how do uh, how, where do people find you and your books and um, whatever you're doing yeah, my, so my books are on Amazon hopefully I'll get this new one out in the next hopefully this week uh, majority report on Instagram I'm force of nature so it's four number four underscore force as in the word force of nature and then um, Facebook I'm stories by Steve Brown is, is my page to uh, where I put all my book stuff on I've got, I've got, I still haven't tied it up. I've got a few social media accounts. But, um, Amazon for the books, though. Amazon, yeah. There's a few Steve Browns. But if you type in something like, you'd be nuts too, because there's only one of them. I've got five. I've got four on there already. But you'd be nuts too. I've got Don't Ask. Well, I'll put the link to your Amazon yeah, author's page in the blurb of this podcast. All right, mate. Nice one, I'll put that there, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, there's lots of Steve. I didn't realise until I published my first book. And then I, was, I, I typed in to see see if it come up. I typed in Steve Brown. There's loads of Steve Browns. Yeah, it's <laughs> not like, the most unique of names. Oh, no, 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 no. I was like, oh no, there's loads. I was like, oh shit. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's only one worse than that, it's John Smith. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or well, Tuff Williams. Is. Mate, cheers for travelling up. I know you came a bit of a big journey, but I'm glad we got it nailed. And uh, it's been, been good crack, mate. Yeah, it's also been good having the live stream going on with Coke. Uh, so yeah. we're going to have him on board. Yeah, cheers for the questions. That's been good. Yeah. Mate, cheers, mate. Do it again, maybe. Yeah. I'm going to get made into your books as well. Yeah, do it, mate. Actually, yeah. read them. Yeah, read yeah. them. I reckon you like them, mate. Yeah, the, the chats we've had on that, you know, we're always in the same wavelength. You like, and you, there's, um, what, which ones you've got? 
but there's a couple that you'll definitely re- recognise quite a few of the characters. I might change some names, but you'll really, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Okay. No. Been a pleasure. Good luck with the rest of it. Nice one, mate.